and get started. Launch the webinar. All right, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 1 p.m. November 16, 2020 study session of Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely today, and I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, please call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's time for the public to comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, <clears throat> and when it's your time to speak, uh, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you have finished commenting on the item of interest. And with that, I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Here. Watkins? Yeah. Oh, you said you Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. Okay, so um, this study session was largely organized because over the course of the summer, many residents had reached out to council members and had commented often, urging for us to consider different approaches to uh, how the city responds to calls for mental health. There's a lot of programs uh, throughout the city and in the county that have been in existence for decades, and so, and in addition to that, many people in the community had spoken about wanting to learn more about um, a program that's become um, very popular, which is called the Crisis Assistance, helping out on the streets program, otherwise known as the CAHOOTS program. And so today is an opportunity for council members and members of the public to learn about the various programs that, that have been in existence in the city, um, to learn about some of the downtown outreach that's done, some programs in the county, and then to also learn more about the CAHOOTS program. Um, there was a little bit of a... Um, uh, an adjustment that needs to be made. So the way we're going to start is we're going to have um, start with Santa Cruz Police Department and Encompass providing a presentation. We'll then have uh, questions and comments from council members. We'll open it up for public comment, and then we'll um, follow that with a presentation from the county and then a presentation by CAHOOTS. And so with that, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Deputy Chief Bernie Escalani to kick us off with um, a presentation on some of the work that Santa Cruz Police does in terms of um, mental health and crisis outreach. All right, thank you, Mayor Cummings. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. All right, All right. Uh, and the rest of council, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Bernie Escalani, Deputy Chief of Police here at the Police Department. Uh, we have a, a quick PowerPoint. Uh, Bonnie's gonna help me uh, hopefully share that and uh, I'll go through that PowerPoint uh, as quick as I can to try to educate council and, and the public of what the department does um, currently and you know always looking for ways to improve our services. Um, go ahead to the next slide, Bonnie, please. Just to try to summarize what we're going to cover today, just again, I'll cover the, the definition of the, the Welfare and Institutions Code 5150 that we're going to be talking about a lot today. Uh, our current responses and procedures for the uh, cl licensed clinicians that we have that ride with our officers uh, today. Um, and then I'm going to have some data for you as far as the number of uh, 5150 holds that we currently have done actually up to date for 2019, 2020, and as well as a, a heat map and a point map showing uh, where we're, we're most busy with these types of calls. Go ahead, next slide. So just to start, here's the, the definition of the 5150 of the Welfare and Institutions Code. Um, mental health disorder, they have to be uh, a danger to themselves or others uh, or gravely disabled. 
Um, and, and really uh, what it comes down to is who has the ability or the authority to uh, put somebody on a 72-hour uh, assessment or hold for further evaluation. And there's very few people that have that authority, one being a, a peace officer, uh, another one being a doctor, and the other one being the licensed uh, clinicians, which we have riding with our officers uh, on patrol seven days a week. Next slide. So the, the current response um, or, or procedure for our officers and the, and the two mental health clinicians that we have uh, working with us from the county, um, basically uh, a call for service will be initiated by either the community, um, someone in crisis can call directly, or an officer can on view uh, certain behaviors out in public that uh, cause a concern and, and a need to do what we would refer to as a welfare check on an individual based off of their behavior. Um, usually our clinical social workers ride with an officer. Uh, again, I mentioned seven days a week and I'll show you their, their work days and, and hours here shortly. But um, right now, because of COVID, they're actually riding in, in separate cars and they have our radios and they log in with dispatch every day, just like a patrol officer does. And uh, they listen to the radio and sometimes uh, they will either self dispatch themselves to a call or attach themselves to a call um, and respond. Sometimes they'll just uh, let us know that they're gonna make a phone call to either the community member that has a concern, sometimes it's a family member, or actually call the person in crisis and, and try to negotiate and, and have a conversation with that individual and get them services just by telephone, uh, which does not require our response. Um, and usually, uh, they, like I said, they, they normally are riding with our officers. Um, but when they're not with us, uh, typically we get these sort of mental health in crisis kind of calls and, and our officers uh, have a lot of training and they are the ones that ultimately are the ones uh, responding to the call if, if the mental health clinicians are not available. Go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, we have two clinical social workers uh, that ride with us 20, uh, not 24 hours a day, but uh, seven days a week. Uh, they split the week in half, one Sunday through Wednesday, that's Danielle, um, and the other one works Wednesday through Saturday, so there's an overlap on Wednesdays. Their hours currently are eight to uh, 6 p.m. Um, and just keep in mind that both Danielle, Danielle and, and Julie are employees of the county. Um, so we do not necessarily have uh, the authority by ourselves to change those hours or change their work schedules, uh, but we do have a really good re working relationship with the county and um, we've negotiated to this point. Uh, these are the hours and the days. Uh, next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, when we are required or needed to respond to these uh, crisis situations, uh, our officers have a tremendous amount of training that they've received um, that we, we really started ramping up about three, four years ago. Um, we started with, we have crisis intervention training. Um, it's 24 hours long, so three days, three consecutive days. Uh, all of our officers will receive this training uh, before they actually get released out into the street after they've graduated from, from the uh, academy. Um, we also have had uh, four hours of county mental health training that obviously Santa Cruz County has provided uh, and our entire department has received this, this training as well. And any new hires that come in also receive that training. 
Um, and then back in December 2019, uh, we received, everybody in the department received tactical communications training, uh, how to de-escalate a situation and how to try to properly communicate uh, with people that are in, in, in crisis. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is some data that uh, we collected from 2019 and 2020. This will show you on the left side, obviously, is the days of the week. Across the top is, is the time of the day. Um, I apologize for those that don't do military time, but that's what we uh, operate under. Um, so this gives you kind of a sense of which days of the week, if there are any, or time of the day that we are uh, most likely to receive a, a 5150 call. Now, keep in mind there's some um, room for error here as far as sometimes we get a call and it might just come out as a, a disturbance or even a fight or something other than a 5150 call. Um, so sometimes, you know, we, all of that doesn't get captured. Um, but you, what you'll find here is uh, there's really no significant day of the week between the two years. We, we did both 2019 and 2020 up to date because obviously this year has been very unique in a lot of ways. Um, so we wanted to have the data to compare uh, with 2019. Um, <clears throat> so what you will see is most of the uh, activity is around uh, midday, um, and, and there really is no trend that shows us necessarily uh, the day of the week or, or a particular day of the week that's uh, more prevalent than others. I'll just give you a second to take a look at that data there. It's, it's a lot to capture, but um, it, it's all really helpful information that we utilize to, to try to structure, obviously, uh, when our licensed clinicians are riding with us. We'll go ahead into the next slide. So as I mentioned, um, you know, we receive 5150 mental health crisis calls around the clock, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. Um, the highest concentration over those two years that I just showed you was about 11, from 11 a.m. To, to roughly 8 p.m. Um, and again, there were no real trends related to the days of the week that was most prevalent. Next slide. Um, so for 2019, uh, this was the data that actually the, the mental health uh, clinicians uh, provided us um, and provided the county. Um, for 2019, they, they tallied over 1,300 contacts uh, and you'll see down at the bottom there, MH1, MH5, those are just their call signs on the radio. Um, so that, that just shows you the, the workload for, for each one of our clinicians um, by the month over the, the year of 2019. Next slide. Also for 2019, of those over 1,300 calls uh, or contacts that they were involved in, uh, this shows the number of 5150 evaluations that were completed um, and the number of 5150 holds that were written by the clinicians, not by the officers. That's solely by the clinicians themselves. And then uh, down at the bottom there, the, you get the referrals for services. Um, and keep in mind, um, one of the things like having the conversation with the county that's very helpful to remind everybody that um, the referral for services is, you know, just the actual referral. This does not, unfortunately, uh, indicate the number of people that were helped out of their situation or out of the situation of being homeless. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, unfortunately, people don't actually act on those referrals, um, but these are referrals that are provided by the uh, mental health clinicians that ride with their officers. And again, this is the same data, but for 2020 up to date, um, 
the total number of contacts up to date is over 1,200 uh, for both of our mental health clinicians. And once again, here's the uh, 2020 outcomes. And you had over 900, almost 1,000 evaluations that were completed. Um, and then you have the smaller number is, is the, the actual holds written by the, uh, the, by the clinicians. And then down below, again, is a lot more referrals in 2020 uh, and a lot more, <clears throat> excuse me, homeless services uh, referrals that were provided uh, by the clinicians. Next slide. Um, so the largest number of calls that our clinical social workers uh, have been involved in have come mostly on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, and the hours are right around midday, 12, 12 to noon. Um, the previous numbers that I showed you, those were for officers uh, and kind of a, a combination of officers and clinical social workers. Uh, the, these numbers are more just for the clinical social workers and what they've been involved in and when are their, their peak times. Next slide. So these are uh, actual 5150 holds that are written by our officers. These are not holds written by the mental health clinicians. Um, these numbers are significantly lower uh, than, than usual just because the clinicians are able to write the holds and, and we just do simply a transport um, and, and uh, we don't actually write the holds. These are the ones that our officers have written either because the, the social worker is not available or it's after, after hours. I uh, also wanted to just provide you as far as locations within the city, um, it really doesn't indicate much, just for your own information. Obviously, uh, in our downtown area uh, and a couple other little hot spots there are the most uh, prevalent locations for us to, and or the, the social workers to be uh, addressing some uh, people that are in a mental health crisis. And one more slide, I believe. And this is basically the same information other than the heat, on the heat map, but uh, a point map that shows you uh, all the calls from 2019 to 2020 up to date that we've received either our officers have dealt with or the uh, social workers have assisted us with. And that is the end. Uh, I'd be open to take any, any questions. Great, Bernie, thanks for that presentation. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll have um, Encompass um, go ahead and give their presentation, and then uh, after that presentation, we can ask questions for both groups. So with that, um, thanks for that presentation, Bernie, and I'll turn it over to Chris Youngren and Christy Brenda from Encompass. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, I think Christy Brenda is going to start, actually. Are you there, Christy? I am, thank you, I just unmuted myself. Um, thank you so much for having us here today. I'm Christy Brenda. I'm the Senior Manager with our Health and uh, Housing Service Area with Encompass Community Services. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Encompass. We're a large nonprofit here in Santa Cruz, Health and, service, Health and Human Services Agency. Um, the service area that we work under is uh, mainly, mo mainly focused on our, um, our homeless, um, and most medically vulnerable here in Santa Cruz County. Um, a little bit about um, Dow, the history of Dow. Um, it was a program through the county that started, I, I believe, a partnership um, back in maybe 1994. So I think that was um, uh, according to Daniel Long, and um, as a way of connecting uh, our folks to the downtown area and services that are needed. Um, and it seems like in back in two. 2013 um, is when Encompass took over that program. And we started out with having uh, one full-time outreach worker in that downtown corridor. Um, and now their program over the last few years has grown to being able to have two full-time workers and hopefully um, more in the future. Um, 
So the Dow program, we operate um, with a budget at about a hundred and a little, uh, a little under one hundred fifty-four thousand per year. We contract with the county, and again, it's a collaboration um, of funds between the city and county. Um, and let's see what else. I'm gonna. Chris is gonna be doing a slideshow um, to go into more detail about um, what uh, she and our other uh, downtown outreach worker Meredith do on a day-to-day -day basis. But they are um, they are full time. Um, for they do four tens, and we cover all all seven days a week downtown. Um, and uh, just today, Chris and I were talking this morning, and we thought we would talk a little bit about um, downtown outreach post COVID. Um, when COVID hit back in March, um, we kind of, you know everybody kind of stopped, went home, um, and uh, you know tried to conduct business from home as much as they could. But with um, with with downtown outreach and with our with our most um, vulnerable folks down. Uh, homeless, we had to kind of kick into high gear and we did a great collaboration with the county. Um, and so Chris is going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chris and um, again, we'll be willing to um, answer any questions that you guys have at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Christy. Okay, just want to check in and make sure everyone can see the slides. Don't have any floods up currently. Okay. Let me see if I can figure this out. How about now? Nope. We still don't see any. Sorry about that. Oh, but now, now it's going. Okay. Now so, go. hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna just fill in a little bit of information about the Downtown Outreach Worker Program, um, which again is, is managed by Encompass Community Services. Uh, let's see here. Um, so it looks like some information is actually missing here. Um, there it is. Uh, so there's, it's a pretty small program. There's just two of us. Um, it's Meredith Flores. She works Sunday through Wednesday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then uh, my name is Chris Youngren. I work Wednesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, the program is, uh, the direct supervisor is Jace Freeman, and their email address is below. And then the senior manager who just spoke is Christy Brenda. Sorry about that. Looks like I'm stuck on this slide. get out of here. Are you guys still able to see? Yep, we can still see your slides. Um, for some reason, I'm having a hard time progressing my slides. as well, you could probably email them over to Bonnie and she might be able to bring them up. Okay, um, I did email them to, let's see if I can do this. They're, they're being forwarded to Bonnie um, right now. Okay, thank you so much, Ralph. Sorry about that, you guys. It's okay. Yeah, it seems like I'm for some reason just stuck on that one. You wanna just go ahead, Chris, and just continue on maybe um, talking through and then we can catch up on the slides. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, sorry, I think I, think I have. Um, can you guys see the screen now? Oh, yeah. Looks like Bonnie's just brought up the slides, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, and then one more after that. Um, so we have a pretty narrow geographic footprint. It literally is just the downtown corridor from Water Street in the north um, to to uh, Royal Street in the south. I can't get out either. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. Let me. So 
are you guys able to see my screen at this point? No. Okay, I, I apologize. Um, I will go ahead and, oh, so you do see a slide that says geographic footprint. I, I, I got it. Okay, I so sorry about that. Um, yeah, so our footprint is pretty narrow. It's basically from Water Street in the north to Laurel Street in the south and includes Front Street, uh, Pacific Avenue, and Cedar Street. A sort of basic description of what we do um, is we connect people experiencing homelessness in the downtown area to resources that increase stability, health, and wellness. Um, so sometimes these are urgent needs like food, clothing, shelter, and hygiene. Um, we also help with longer term needs like housing, employment, benefits, medical, mental health, uh, and substance use disorder services. And occasionally um, emergency needs, so EMS and emergency mental health, uh, crisis intervention, that sort of thing. Um, how clients reach us usually is um, we can always, you, you can always reach us at our phone number or email address. We also um, travel throughout the downtown corridor and engage with people experiencing homelessness. We receive a lot of referrals from the downtown ambassadors, uh, merchants downtown, other service providers, and just the general public. Uh, we also have regular outreach hours at the downtown branch of the public library on Monday and Thursday from two to four and in the portable trailer behind the courthouse um, on Wednesday and Friday from 10 to two. So we're one of a handful of um, providers that offer the Homeward Bound program. It's a city funded program that provides individuals with transportation to their city of origin in order to reunite with housing and support in that area. It's part of a larger strategy that we're sort of adopting uh, community-wide of diversion, which seeks to kind of prevent homelessness at the front door uh, by helping individuals identify immediate al alternate housing arrangements and then connecting them with services to help them return to housing. In fiscal year 2019-2020, uh, we provided 65 Greyhound bus tickets for individuals returning home. So we consider the outreach that we do to be housing-focused outreach, um, kind of based on the idea that housing is ultimately the solution to homelessness. Um, there's a large body of evidence that shows that permanent supportive housing is a cost-effective way to uh, not only improve health outcomes, but reduce the use of emergency services, including emergency psychiatric services. So as part of this housing-focused outreach concept, um, we also participate in the Smart Path system. We provide Smart Path assessments, which is a way for folks to get on wait lists for housing that they might be eligible for. Um, we work to try to identify current case management support that might be able to connect individuals to housing. And we try to identify open wait lists whenever possible and assist clients in applying to those open wait lists. Um, so our work really changed quite a bit um, in the time of COVID. Uh, a lot of the businesses downtown were closed for an extended period of time and uh, we partnered at that time and continue to partner with the county health department, uh, the county-led HOPES team, the Homeless Persons Health Project, the downtown streets team, um, and there were a few volunteers to provide COVID-19 screening supplies to help with social distancing, masks, food, water, and referrals to motels and shelter. Um, the supplies and supports uh, were available and are still available at pop-up sites, most notably probably the Emmeline Avenue site on Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. And then we're also doing, uh, offering these same services and supports and screening doing outreach out in the field. 
In terms of our outreach outcomes, um, we contact approximately 120 unduplicated individuals each month. Um, a lot of those individuals we make contact with more than once during the month. We make over uh, 200 referrals each month and that results in over 150 service connections. Uh, we case manage 10 individuals per month and provide, I would say, approximately 10 or so homeward bound tickets on average every month. And that is the end of my presentation or my part. Great. Thank you so much for that information. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up to council members to see if anyone had questions um, from um, the folks from Encompass and also from our Santa Cruz Police Department. Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Chris and Christy, thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering about the success of the Homeward Bound um, tickets. You mentioned that, you know, you provide a number of tickets to you. Do you find that those folks, that you don't see them coming back into town again? Or I'm just curious about the effectiveness of, you know, when you do get somebody reacquaint, you know, re um, back in touch with their family and they do take take advantage of the homeward bound. I'm just curious about the sort of the efficacy of that and, and just your reflections on that since you've been working with it for a while. Yeah, I mean, I would say that there definitely are people that return. Um, but then there's also, uh, I think, really huge successes. I can think of one um, young guy who was actually connected to our mental health system here in Santa Cruz County who went to his place of origin, which was Pennsylvania, and ended up in housing. He His housing actually there was affordable for him. He ended up um, connecting with mental health services back then. So I think in those cases, it, I mean, the successes probably shine a little brighter than, than the people who are returning. I don't have the exact numbers of that though. Great, thank you. And then I did have a question for um, um, Escalani. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that um, you had a category on the referral slides that it was so thick of the orange color that just said medical, and I'm just curious that you were to, it was referring um, it was regarding the referral. So there was referrals that sounded like homeless services, uh, medical, um, and what is the other one? There was those. There were blue bars, an orange bar, and uh, I was trying to remember. What is the medical, when someone gets referred for medical, is that the emergency? I'm just curious what medical means. Is it treated there on site or is it um, referred to other services, for example, at the ER or just curious about that? Yeah, most of uh, those referrals uh, are not necessarily, uh, you know, sending the, the, the patient out to Dominican Hospital. Uh, it could be more referrals out at the M-Line Center. Okay. Uh, over um, on Coral Street, they also have some, they provide medical attention over there. Um, so yeah, it's, most of those numbers are, are lower level, if you will, than, than the emergency room sort of visit. But you would refer them to M-Line or HPHP, so it's that. Uh, and do the, is there a, I'm just, I guess I'm wondering, is there an, a um, sort of when, we, when there's a medical evaluation, are they, is it, is there also a physical, at least to the extent that maybe someone has a wound or maybe somebody, you know, has, I'm just curious, like when someone's assessed, what's kind of, what's in that assessment, I guess? You know, most of that is, is probably going to be better provided that that detail by the county they probably would be able to answer answer that question better than i would okay thank you yeah those are all my questions okay yes 
So James, uh, your camera. James on the, yeah, maybe James could chime in on that uh, that that question. Sure thing. Um, so on the medical, again, keeping in mind that the mental health liaisons are behavioral health, so our primary, we're not doing medical interventions, but obviously if we see someone tells us something that lends us to think that, hey, you need some medical follow-up, we're going to refer you over to the IBH clinics, which is over at um, M-Line or Planned Parenthood Clinic, um, some of those other uh, lower level clinics. If it's an ER um, thing, then obviously that's an immediate concern and they're gonna be taken by ambulance right away. So again, that's kind of some preventative things that we're like, wow, this is probably gonna go to an ER visit if you don't get some lower level of care right away. So we're just trying to divert things, get them set up, because again, um, those medical issues can turn into crisis issues later on down the road if we don't attend to them as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you, James. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Councilmember Matthews. A uh, couple of questions. I noticed the hours that Bernie gave of their um, the heavy hours of call for service were um, 11 a.m. to 8 p.m., but for the social workers and downtown workers, I think the hours are more 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., at least for the social workers. So I just wonder to what extent doesn't have to answer now, but it raises the question of making this thinking up better the working hours with when the calls for service come in. So I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. It was just something that left out at me. Comment, not comment. Um, then I will ask my other question, and that is about. Um, I mean, we have we have been uh, having the downtown outreach workers and the. Um, uh, the social workers attached to PD for a good long time. And I know they're out there in the field. I see them and I've talked with them and they're making a lot of contact. It's my impression that a large number of those are repeat, 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 that the workers know their life story. They, they know a lot about them. And so, and it is interesting, we just had the study session last week on the focus strategies and trying to, to, to do a sense of better coordination so we're moving people to a better place, not wanting to necessarily define progress or cure, but <laughs> move it, moving to a better place. So um, I'm just wondering if either the downtown outreach workers, the social workers have a, um, uh, just a comment on those observations of mine, which are obviously not directly in the field, but over time and trying to pay attention. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think a question. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm happy to start. Um, yeah, I, I feel like a lot of the contacts that we have are people that we know well. And I think for Meredith and myself, the goal is to always try to assist someone in getting one step ahead of at least where they are now. So oftentimes that's getting people into shelter first. Um, I know that uh, with our expanded shelter that we have now, there's probably more people are sheltered or staying in motels than we probably ever have in the, had in the past. Um, which is a good a good step in the right direction. Um, but yeah, I, f I feel like for people that we see repeatedly, um, there is a lot of coordination behind the scenes in, tr in trying to figure out sort of how can we move this person forward in some way. All right. No further comments. Um, does that are those all the questions you had, Councilor Matthews? Yeah, thanks. I, I, and I'll just comment. I think that's kind of what we hear from the public. <laughs> you know, a, a sense of I just to use the vernacular frustration. You know, so much effort and good intention, and and yet still seeing so much out there that needs to be done with the same people over and over. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, next up we have Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Byers. Yeah, 
Thank you. Thanks for the presentations and uh, kind of a, an overview and some of the numbers. It's really helpful to see um, the, those, the data and kind of help and understand a little bit more of what that's like on the ground. Um, my question is kind of a big picture question. Um, and for anybody who is uh, up for trying to answer this, and I'm, I want to ask everybody who's involved in these systems um, uh, the question, you know, what do you see as the biggest obstacles or challenges mm -hmm. to doing your work? Um, you know, and, and I know that that's really big and there's a lot of things that we could talk about and obviously it's resources, um, resources, resources um, is a huge piece of that, but just like offhand, like if just something that like, gosh, if we just had this or if we could do it a different way or if we, you know, what, what is it that's um, problematic for you all in getting your work done effectively? I might need a couple minutes to think about that. Kind of a tough one. I just am interested, you know, and if you don't have immediate responses, it's something that I, I feel like talking about that, um, you know, with, uh, with the council, with leaders who are making decisions, and also for the public to understand what that, what that looks like for you all. Well, I think I'll, I'll, uh, oh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was just going to say that um, I think resources, yeah. just in general, is a huge one. I think also, it may be difficult, so so we case manage um, ten individuals per month ourselves. Um, but it may it seems like it's difficult at times from our position doing outreach and engagement to um, perhaps do the work of case management, which can be really hard um, to sort of follow people and get them where they need to be or, or assist them in getting where they need to be, if that makes sense. Yeah, and also I'd just like to add, I think, um, you know, it's, it's great that we're able, that downtown outreach workers are able to case manage um, a handful of people at a time, but, you know, a lot of times we get, um, we get folks that, you know, maybe are, are calling because they've moved on, maybe they're not downtown, but, some, you know, sometimes we get into this pinch where we're supporting people that aren't technically in the downtown corridor at that time, and it's really hard to say to, to say no to certain folks, but I know that, you know, one of the biggest pieces that we everybody is talking about ad nauseum is, is the lack of housing resources and the lack of, like, long-term case management for people. Um, a lot of times, you know, uh, folks, you know, will have gotten successfully housed, but then the support stops, um, and Chris and Meredith find themselves, um, you know, getting phone calls from landlords or different people in the community to try to help this this folk, this person, and try to get them connected to case management. And that's something we really, really are lacking. So um, that, that's what I would say. Um, I'll I'll add to the uh, the bandwidth. I guess not only as a city, but uh, as the entire county. I've talked to a lot of county employees as well that are involved in the same field and it's just the bandwidth is really uh, just not there to handle the volume of the uh, the issues that we have um i'm going to add a little bit of a different component um that i know i've i've gotten from even our our clinical workers um uh, we have a tremendous methamphetamine problem in our community um, and it is really difficult even for the professionals to tell the difference between, um, um, you know, the, the use of methamphetamines and somebody in mental health crisis. Um, and uh, I don't necessarily have the data on this, but just from my professional opinion, I think that um, it is very common for people uh, to self-medicate and it makes things very difficult uh, to assess what really the problem is and, and really kind of which direction to go as far as looking for a solution. Um, but I, I think that we also as a community could just do quite a bit more in the area of drug addiction and methamphetamines in our, in our streets right now. Councilman Brown, were those all the questions you had? Uh, yeah, for now, thank you. Yes, appreciate your thoughts. Uh, Councilmember Byers. Thanks. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm thinking of you, I think the two of you, maybe the third person who I can't seem to see, uh, as caseworkers, it's, it's got to be very, I know it's very difficult. I'm on the Housing Matters Board, and I just hear so much about from the caseworkers, and uh, they just, all of you are just the heroes in this whole system. You really are. It's got to be very difficult. Uh, and I know that we need, need many, many more for sure, and raise your salaries, of course, as well. But um, there was a statement, and uh, when you first opened the presentation, I'm not sure whether it was Chris or Christy, it mentioned how um, the housing, everyone is uh, pretty much is understood now that getting people in housing is the way to end homelessness and the way to help people. And I don't know that encompasses much on housing. And we're here to talk about the mental health. We're not here talking about, you know, ending homelessness by getting them in a house. But I just, are there some uh, special programs where the mental ill, are they prioritized for some of the housing programs? And maybe, maybe it's a narrow question, but maybe you could just answer a bit of it yeah. to help me on that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and with our health and housing service area, we have um, we have a few different programs that offer housing, and we have a couple. Um, uh, we're part of our local COC, our Continuum of Care, and we have some HUD grants um, with, for, that have um, put together some small programs. So we do have um, Housing for Health, uh, which we uh, collaborate, which is a HUD, a HUD funded program, um, and we work to um, house our most vulnerably, um, medically vulnerable and homeless and mentally ill um, here in Santa Cruz. And those referrals, it's a referral based program, and those come through Smart Path. Um, and you know we uh, we do both the housing navigation and the long-term case management for that and we found that to be an extremely successful program um, in our um, and, and keeping those folks get, finding housing for them and then keeping them housed um, we have a believe um, it's a very small program it's right now it's funded for one one full-time FT and we have 14 um, 14 folks I believe housed right now we also have another um, small program called new roots and that is a collaboration also through um, our local COC, a HUD grant, um, and we are the subrecipients for that um, with Housing Authority. Um, and that is focused on, um, that's a white, actually, our youth ho homeless demonstration project, part of that program, um, and that's focused on housing um, the same um, youth um, that are also um, very, that are also most vulnerable and have some mental health experiences. Um, and we are currently, um, Currently, I think we are, our goal is housing six youth. Um, so it's incredibly hard. Again, those come also come through Smart Path, um, but it's hard. It's hard to one locate the folks. It's hard to get them housing ready. Um, but there are with that particular program, there are vouchers ready for those folks. Um, and then uh, with our adults, we get them on our Section Eight um, vouchers as well. So um, we do have some, not a lot, but we have some small and mighty programs, and we would um, love to to continue to grow in this area of Encompass for sure. Thank you. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thank you. Helpful. I had a couple um, questions, some of which are pretty basic, but um, I was wondering with the city's liaison program that they have, when did that start? Uh, we started with uh, one liaison back in uh, 2016, 2017, mm. and actually she started as a, a downtown outreach worker, and you know we saw the work and some successes so much that we recruited her to just start riding with our officers because we were frequently uh, driving down, down, picking her up and taking her to other parts of the city <laughs> to, to utilize her skills. Um, and then we added a second one, I want to say it's been about a year and a half uh, now. Okay, thanks for that information. And um, I was just curious, so, um, just thinking about you know businesses downtown and when people are making these calls. So I guess starting with downtown, um, what kind of outreach is done with the businesses to kind of let them know? And is there a special number they can call if, for example, someone you know is in their business and 
you know, maybe experiencing a mental health episode? Um, yeah, so I think all the downtown businesses sh should have our contact information. I know Sonia has been really amazing at putting together periodic um, information sessions um, where usually the PD is introduced, um, businesses can talk about sort of the issues that they're experiencing, and then the outreach program is introduced. Um, and we try to make sure everyone has our has our contact information, and try to really be responsive to to those calls. Um, I think some of the things that can happen, or that businesses experience, or or workers experience downtown, can be quite scary. And so um, it's definitely helpful, I think, to have someone to call for any for really any issue related to homelessness. And Mayor, I'd like to add too, we've also, as, as our department, we've done some uh, sort of de-escalation training as well with some of the merchants and, and business owners downtown as well to try to handle some of the difficult situations that Chris is referring to. And then I guess as a follow-up to that, so if, you know, someone wanted to call, you know, the police, um, rather than the downtown outreach workers, would that just normally, would that go through the normal kind of 911 dispatch? And then would they, you know, be able to explain the type of services they need, or is there a different number that people would call if they needed, you know, in particular that, that liaison service? Well, it's kind of two different services. You have Encompass, which obviously would, being downtown, and then we have our own clinicians. Uh, Typically, if there's a 911 call, non-emergency or, or, or not, um, then the call comes out and the officer's prepared to respond. But if we have a clinician that's working, uh, oftentimes that clinician will kind of take the call from the officer uh, and, and sometimes and oftentimes be able to resolve it themselves. And right now, oftentimes it's just by phone. Um, so yeah, it does go through the same, but I think there are specific numbers to, to be able to come into contact with Chris and her team. Okay, thanks. And I guess I have one more question, and I was just curious, you know, we, when you put the numbers up um, for calls in 2019 and 2020, I was just wondering what percentage of the total number of calls do these types of calls make up? I, I don't have that number off the top of my head. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, and again, the, the, it just gives you a small snapshot. Um, it's it's there's certainly times we get called, uh, and it turns out to be somebody in, in a mental health crisis situation, but it didn't come out that way. Sometimes it, it could be listed as a battery report. It could be even a shoplifting. But it turns out to be actually somebody that, that really needs some referrals and services. Great, thanks. Um, Councilmember Brown. Thanks. I just had uh, I thought of one other thing. Uh, actually, two other things. If, would it be possible to get those PowerPoint um, presentations, um, access to those? Um, uh, we we got the agenda reports, but it's I didn't have a chance to write down all those numbers, and it would be great to just be able to reference them. Um, so that's one. And then since you brought this up. Um, Mr. Escalante, I am, uh, or Deputy Chief Escalante, excuse me. <laughs> I um, am wondering if, so So one question I have, and I was gonna ask the county folks about this, um, treatment beds, you know, I've heard that that can, can be an issue um, when uh, someone's ready for treatment. Actually, uh, Chief Mills was talking about this the other night, I was on a panel with him, and, and there's not a bed available, right? So there's, we know it, there's a limit there, but how many beds are there? Do any of you know, um, or could you share that with us? And, um, you know, and then kind of just thinking about, um, you know, I brought that up in the context of um, your comment about the, the difficulty differentiating between, um, you know, methamphetamine-induced um, uh, behavioral uh, issues and um, mental health 
uh, kind of uh, as, uh, on their own. And I know there's a lot of uh, dual diagnosis is a term that I um, am familiar with, but I know it's ch changing. And so, but so dual diagnosis is an issue. I guess I'm just wondering um, if you could talk about um, that in terms of how you know how the, the channels that people end up in, depending on you know how how that plays out. And, and kind of what, what the landscape looks like for, um, you know, getting people treatment um, for meth addiction and other addictions as well. Yeah, I can, I can answer the second part to your, the second uh, question. The first one probably be best to come from somebody at the county as far as the number of beds. Um, typically, if we come into contact with somebody that's acting out, um, <clears throat> depending on how violent they are, uh, or cooperative or not, um, you know, it's really hard to do an assessment and, and sit down and have a, a, a rational conversation with them to really decipher whether it's uh, mental illness or, or uh, use of methamphetamines or some sort of narcotic. Um, oftentimes, uh, if we believe the person is under the influence and they're not able to care for themselves because by, by signs of their behavior, uh, they they end up going to the, the county jail until they sober up and and then they're released. Inside the jail, there are services. I can't speak to those. Uh, the county probably could provide more detail. Um, but that's where, you know, sometimes somebody that really needs the resources may not necessarily get it because they're either under the influence of methamphetamine or at least suspected to be under the influence of methamphetamine based off of their behavior. Um, it, you know, we don't test their blood or anything like that. Um, it's really hard to tell and sometimes they may not get the resources or services that would best uh, suit them for their situation. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, um, I think what I'll do is this time, if there's members of the public who'd like to comment on this first item, which were presentations from Encompass Community Services and the Santa Cruz Police Department, now's the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. And once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes to comment. Can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, everybody, for the presentation. This is Serge Cagno. Um, I do some homeless outreach and some advocacy, and I'm on the county's mental health advisory board, too. Um, I really I really appreciate all of the services that we've been talking about are definitely supportive services, um, trying to help people change their lives. Um, I just had a few comments about the numbers that we were talking about. Um, for uh, just pointing out that part of what we're talking about is um, when we're talking about the 5150 calls, that's a significantly different number than the holds or the people that are actually um, yeah, eligible for um, getting a hold. So part of that, because that's such a high number, that was over the 600, I believe, and the actual holds was down about 130, I could see the PowerPoint, sorry about that, um, which implies that there's also some community education that is necessary and other services that could be available for people. Um, questioning there, wondering there, uh, how many of those people are not eligible for services but get some sort of service to actually move them forward and whether that's um, whether somebody's getting an arrest or a citation or whether somebody's getting a referral. But a referral, as was stated, you know, is just a referral. There's no follow-up, which is part of the challenge of our system that we don't have enough people that are taking the time to help somebody move forward. Um, part of that also is with the Homeward Bound program. Um, there's a lot of money that goes into that. There are other programs that actually do that too. And, it's great when somebody actually is connected, but if you look at the, um, the studies across the country, there's, it's actually a pretty low positivity rate 
uh, for you know actual success because there's no follow-up. Um, I think we've all, everybody who's been home bound people in Santa Cruz has seen people come back to Santa Cruz. Um, again, great when it works, but uh, without follow-up, uh, it, it, uh, right, sir, it's gonna have throwing to money out the window a little bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for setting it up. Okay, thanks. Hello, this is Richard Gallo calling State Ambassador for Access California. I just want to say it's a good presentation. I do believe that we need to move into a more better model to assist the mental health community, especially when it comes to 24-7 instead of the hours that's currently being provided by the county. According to a report, 43.8 million adults in the United States experience mental illness every year. 10 million people report struggling with a severe mental illness that interferes with their major life activities. An individual with mental health is 16 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement than any other suspects. And there is currently a 24-hour line for the mental health community run by the California Peer One line. That number is 1-855-845-7415, and it's 24-7, including holidays. We need to explore and help the mental health community. The tragedy that happened with Jeffrey Art, I realized that police officers were doing their job how they were trained when he was unfortunately killed. I strongly believe what the mother wrote in the article back then, that that could have been my adult son. Shoot his leg, shoot his arm instead of killing him. So there's a working progress that needs to be done. There is lack of affordable housing in Santa Cruz County. That is a major barrier for our community. Second issue relating to housing is for those that are homeless that have eviction record, criminal record, bad credit record. It makes it even more difficult to obtain housing. We don't, we need more specialized housing like they have in San Jose, East Bay, and the Bay Area. There's a lot of programs there that we can help in our county. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just given the time, I think what we'll do, there's, I see three hands up, and so I'm gonna have those people speak, and then, and we're gonna um, shift it to one minute because I wanna make sure that there's enough time for us to have the county presentation and the CAHOOTS presentation. So um, the three people whose hands were up, um, I'll give you all one minute. We'll take a brief break just so we can stretch our legs, and then we'll move back into the county presentation. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Adam Novak, um, and I had some, I guess, like a question slash comment, sort of comparing the two programs. Uh, it sounds. I was wondering if it could be clarified whether all the calls that the police respond to for mental health end up being 5150 evaluations. It seems like, like given the rate at which those evaluations have come up positive. Um, and the chance that instead of the liaison on any given day, you get just ordinary police. I would kind of hesitate to call 911 for a mental health emergency if I see someone sort of on the street behaving erratically. It would be much nicer if 911 could connect to something more like the, the outreach program that really connects people to resources versus asking the question, do we have to hold this person against their will? And if that could be sort of beefed up to 24 hours and given some more resources to, to house people and to back them across the city. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Hi, this is Peter Gelblum. I have three questions about the Homeward Bound program. 
which I really would love answered. One is, before putting people on a bus, do you contact the family members or whoever you're sending them home to to make sure there'll be somebody waiting for them uh, to help them? Second, do you do any follow-up on them after you've sent them home? Uh, and three, how do you measure success? Is it, as Council Member Myers suggested, that they don't come back to Santa Cruz, or is it instead that the person has gotten good treatment uh, where they were sent? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I can answer that. Um, so yes, we do require that a person has a contact in the area that they're headed to, where the, a place that they can stay, essentially. Um, so we do require that, and we speak to that person before we purchase a Greyhound ticket for them. Um, unfortunately, we don't do a lot of follow-up after that point, and I don't think that we really have any information in terms of, you know, how many people return end up returning to the area. Um, and I think just someone arriving back home and having a place to stay is, is really the success or how success has been defined so far. But that it's worth looking at. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. And then with that, we'll move on to the last caller before we um, have any further questions answered and then move on to our next presentation. Hello, um, uh, Reggie calling in. Um, so uh, this was a very interesting presentation. Um, I really, uh, as someone who really cares about making sure people get taken care of and someone who really likes guarantees for poor people and not sort of like hand waving or just like hopefully it works out kind of uh, policies, I really do not uh, like the Homeward Bound program. Um, I don't like uh, similarly sweeps of RVs uh, without guaranteed spots and safe parking places. Um, and to get a little bit more specific, um, though the uh, officer didn't have numbers on the police report, yeah, smart idea. Um, the 2017 police report, um, which was the last robust police report that the public actually got, uh, said that nearly half of calls, 46% of calls for service were check or suspicious activity. And then of course today, 50% of the police budget is spent on patrolling. Um, so this obviously feels like quite a bit of uh, resources and effort is going towards police just investigating things that they don't even uh, know about. And so I think we should really replace a uh, role here with mental health services, with housing services, with social workers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna close public comment. Um, are there any further questions or comments from council members at this moment in time? Okay. Seeing none, I wanna thank you all for taking the time to provide those presentations for the council and for the community. And again, thank you for all the hard work that you all are doing. Um, in this field. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we take a, a quick break, um, maybe about five minutes, and we'll come back and have a presentation from the county. For the sake of time, why don't we go ahead and get uh, and just um, get started with the next presentation? So uh, the next presentation we have is from the County of Santa Cruz's Behavioral Health Division, uh, Mental Health and Substance Abuse Disorders, and so the presenters today will be Eric Riera, Director of Mental Health, uh, Cassandra Islami, Senior Behavioral Health Program Manager, and James Russell, Forensic Services Program Manager. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to do a quick sound check, make sure everyone can hear me okay. Excellent. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. 
And thank you, Mayor Cummings, for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Eric Riero. I'm the Behavioral Health Director for Santa Cruz County. And I'm here today with Karen Kern, who is our Director of Adult Services, Cassandra Oslami, who is our Director of South County Services and Community Engagement, and James Russell, our Forensic Services Manager. I wanted to talk at the beginning uh, a little bit about our organization just to provide some context about behavioral health and how it fits in with the County Health Services Agency. Um, HSA is our parent organization that we are part of um, together with our Environmental Health Department, Public Health, and our Clinics Division. And we make up about 50% of the overall health services agency budget. So we're the largest division within HSA. Our behavioral health divisions include our adult services, children's services, community engagement, administration, psychiatry, substance use disorder services, public guardian, and quality improvement. And I just got a message from my colleague that you can't see my screen. I was just about to ask if we were just seeing your screen, so. Okay, well, let me try that again. Now we can see it. You can see it now? Okay, good. Um, and I have our contact uh, information listed on the slide, and I'll provide a copy of the slides to the city so that you can access that at a later date. So the term behavioral health includes both mental health services as well as substance use disorder services. And our mental health side has a focus on serving adults with a severe mental illness and children with a serious emotional disturbance who have Medi-Cal as their primary payer and they meet state eligibility requirements for specialty mental health services. We also are required through our contract with the state to provide crisis services to any resident of the county and that's regardless of what type of insurance they have or their ability to pay. On our substance use disorder side, our focus is again on county residents who require substance use disorder treatment services, who have Medi-Cal as their primary payer. Our services and our connection to our different providers in the community is based on a level of care assessment tool called the ASAM, which determines program placement in the community. We refer to our service system as a system of care within the county. It's really built upon partnerships between the county and our local nonprofits who collaborate closely on the care of residents of the county. We all share a common electronic health record to support collaboration and communication between our providers. And we have a system that's built both on the provision of mental health as well as substance use disorder services. And one of the things I also wanted to point out is that the county behavioral health is a managed care organization and we're responsible for administering the specialty mental medical mental health and substance use disorders services plan for on behalf of the state of California. Behavioral health services in the county um, relies on a number of partnerships with nonprofits in the community and this is a listing of some of our um, current partners who deliver services in collaboration with the county. And our funding comes from a number of different sources, including funding from the county, which is about 5%. Our Mental Health Services Act fund, the millionaire's tax from the state of California makes up about 15% of our funding. Behavioral Health Realignment Funds makes up about 20% of our funding. 
The largest portion comes from federal financial participation in the Medicaid program, which is about 40% of our funding. And then other agency county fees, insurance, grant funding, and contributions from local municipalities total about 20%. So I wanted to highlight some key areas of our service system, the first of which are crisis services. We have a crisis continuum of care, and I'm gonna provide highlights in each of these different areas. Um, so the county provides walk-in crisis services to any, again, any resident of the county, which includes crisis assessment and intervention services for adults and children. And we also have a focus on providing linkage and referral to other treatment providers for follow-up care, including providers within the county system. That walk-in crisis service program operates Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and it's located at our uh, Santa Cruz office at 1400 MLI. We also have a mobile emergency response team which operates Monday through Friday 8 to 7 and we also have weekend coverage now. It's a field-based program so we will see individuals in crisis both within the office and out in the community. And we are responding primarily to individuals who have, are having a serious mental health crisis. And then part of what um, we discussed earlier this morning, earlier this afternoon, was the mental health liaison program where we have mental health clinicians embedded within the Santa Cruz Police Department, but also with the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office and the Watsonville Police Department. And that program began as, as um, early as 2013, um, and we've been expanding it year after year since then. Our Santa Cruz Police Department Liaison Program operates seven days a week, as does our program with the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office. And with Watsonville Police Department, we have one mental health liaison who works five days a week. Our mobile emergency response team, which we call MERT, is the goal is to address mental health emergencies in the community and increase access and linkage to appropriate services by providing field-based response for both children and adults. We provide crisis assessment response, intervention and stabilization and safety planning, psychoeducation and support to children and adults as well as their families, and referral, linkage, and follow-up sessions for anyone um, needing those until they're connected with services. Our newest program is our MERDI program, our Mer Mobile Emergency Response Team for Youth. This is gonna be based in South County. Um, we have received a grant to actually construct and build a mobile behavioral health office, which you see pictured. Um, we will be rolling that out at the end of December, and the staff will include a bilingual clinician as well as a family specialist who will respond to crisis calls in the Watsonville community as a team. Our mental health liaison program, we've talked a little bit about already. Uh, this is a co-response model with law enforcement that does assessments for 5150s, referrals to services, and they also do follow-up. So after the crisis has averted, uh, they will reach out to people that they've had contact with and do that critical follow-up to engage them in services after. It's a co-response model, so our mental health liaisons are working with law enforcement out in the field. And as I mentioned before, we currently have five full-time staff working that program and have heard a strong interest in expanding the program to include additional clinicians. Um, our contacts by program total about 2,615 contacts year to date. That's through January through October 2020. And we've broken down the percentage of first time contacts um, varies from 48 to 66%. 
and we also broke down the percent contacts where we're having multiple engagements with the same individuals during a one month period of time. You can see that varies from between eight and close to 15%. Um, in terms of our outcomes, I believe there's a question about what percentage of assessments that were done by the mental health liaisons actually resulted in a 5150 hold. Those vary between 20 and 36 percent, averaging about 30 percent. So, on average, about 70 percent of those assessments and contacts do not result in a 5150 hold. Rather, their focus is on engaging the individual in follow up services and treatment. This is just a quick illustration for the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office where we're seeing those contacts by location and as you can see most of them, 52%, are taking place in mid-county area. Again, for our Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office, these are the contacts by type. So the majority, 43%, are with individuals who have a serious mental illness, followed by substance use disorder, and then other de-escalation issues. This is just another representation of uh, the percentage of contacts that result in different referrals for follow-up. The majority of referrals, 57%, are for additional mental health services and then followed by other community-based resources, um, medical services with our, our clinics and our homeless person's health project and then some of the smaller categories listed below. For the Santa Cruz Police Department, again, most of our contacts are in other, 14% um, taking place downtown, 4% in a parks, and 24% are actually handled by telephone. For Santa Cruz PD, these are a breakdown of the contacts by type. So similar to Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office, the majority of contacts are for individuals who have a severe mental illness, 45%, followed by individuals who have a substance use disorder, about 39%. This is a breakdown of referrals for follow-up for Santa Cruz PD. Um, a little bit smaller percentage for mental health, about 38%, and then followed by other community-based resources at 24%, and then medical services at 18%. For our Watsonville Police Department Liaison Program, this is a breakdown of the types of contacts. For that program, most of the contacts are actually done by telephone. Contacts by type, very similar pattern to what we're seeing in Santa Cruz. The majority of contacts, 38%, are for individuals with a severe mental illness, followed by 33% for individuals with a substance use disorder. And for follow-up, this should be um, Watsonville. 53% um, are being referred for mental health treatment and 34% are for other community-based social service resources. We also have two programs that I wanted to highlight this afternoon that are focused on the homeless. Our HOPES team, which was mentioned earlier, uh, which is our homeless outreach team, and then our FIT program, which is a public safety program that was created um, through a tax measure by the Sheriff's Office. So our focused intervention team, the FIT team, is a public safety pilot program structured to engage individuals in the community who have had repeated contacts with law enforcement and whose behaviors are threatening to the public safety. So these are individuals who, for the majority of them, are actually homeless, but they're the ones that are attracting the most attention from law enforcement. There's repeated calls from them 
uh, about their threatening behavior in the public. And FIT is primarily a proactive program. So the sheriff deputies are partnering with our, our law enforcement liaisons attached to this program. And they're doing proactive engagement in the community for a small number of people who meet the criteria for the program. And pre-COVID, um, we were also able to use the county jail um, and a flash incarceration model to put these individuals in a secure setting if their behavior rose to the occasion where previously they would have been booked and released, um, which provides us an opportunity to really engage them and have a different way of connecting them with services. And again, for our FIT program, the goal is to support individuals in the community and link them to treatment and engage them in that critical treatment that they so often need. Um, they also do the outreach and engagement model. So for many of these individuals, they're folks who are not amenable to treatment. Um, they're not someone that you can give them a number to call or bring them to an appointment. It often takes multiple attempts um, in order to connect them with services. And the, the FIT clients tend to be some of the most difficult people in the community um, that we're working with in terms of community engagement. So as visible as the program may be, um, and as many contacts that happen with these folks, um, the rate of engagement tends to be much smaller than some of our other programs. Um, in terms of the types of issues that are presenting um, when our FIT team makes contact with, with these individuals in the community, about 83% are homeless at the time of engagement, so the vast majority of referrals are already homeless. 37% are already connected with mental health services. 30% have had a smart path assessment at the time of engagement around their housing needs. 13% have had a psychiatric hospitalization within the last six months. And 13% have participated in substance use treatment in the past six months. Our HOPES team, which stands for Homeless Outreach and Proactive Engagement Strategies team, is a collaboration between the City of Santa Cruz and County Behavioral Health Department uh, with a focus on outreach to homeless individuals in the community for assessment, engagement, and connection to services. And there are multiple pathways that are connected to the HOPES program, including linkage to our specialty courts within the county, the Behavioral Health Court for individuals with um, felony charges pending, and then the PACT Court, which has more of a focus on homeless individuals with misdemeanor charges. Here's a quick graphic from a presentation we had done to the City Council several years ago um, that shows those four different pathways depending on the level of court involvement for the individual as well as the severity of their mental illness or substance use disorder. There are these four different tracks that people can go down, um, including repeated efforts at outreach and engagement for people um, until they eventually get connected with treatment. This is just a quick illustration of the referral sources for the HOPES program. Um, majority right now are actually coming from our downtown outreach worker, which you heard from earlier this afternoon, as well as in South County. So there's a significant homeless problem in South County as well, and we tend to get quite a few referrals um, from our South County services and providers down in that area. And our Homeless Persons Health Project, which I will not talk about this afternoon, um, but it is both a health and behavioral health program that's run by our clinics division. And that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.
for all that information and for that wonderful presentation. Um, I guess we can start. I'll open it up to council members to see if any council members have any questions. Council member Watkins. Uh, thank you for the presentation. That was really helpful. And I guess I guess I have sort of a quick question, and maybe this is more of a broader sort of state kind of statewide state legislator question. But what um, kind of what is the role of government or the role of your department if there's a mentally a severely mentally uh, ill individual who just sort of refuses um, treatment, but it's frequently cycled through um, through our interventions, but at what point can sort of a state intervention or sort of a, uh, some sort of intervention occur to support that individual who is you know, ge genuinely gravely disabled to the extent that they can't you know, care or make decisions for themselves? And, uh, yeah, and that, that's a great question. Um, and you use the term gravely disabled, and that's really a, a key decision point. Um, one of the offices under behavioral health is the public guardianship program. Um, and individuals who are not able to care for themselves um, can be referred to the public guardian and through the court system be appointed a conservator. However, they have to meet some very stringent legal requirements around grave disability. So although we might see someone who's refusing treatment and struggling to take care of themselves out in the community, the court holds us to a very high standard um, that has to be met before that person's rights can be taken away. And if they can answer some basic questions around where they're going to get food and where they're going to sleep at night, um, the courts are hesitant to take that individual's rights away and appoint a public guardian. Now, when we admit someone to an inpatient program due to a grave disability, so if they've come to the attention of law enforcement and they're at imminent risk and we've now admitted them involuntarily, that's often the point that we are able to pursue a conservatorship um, and appoint a public guardian who will then oversee that individual's care and placement in the community for services. There is um, pending legislation that's been reviewed and, and looked at, um, particularly down in so uh, Southern California that may be applied statewide to um, broaden the criteria for who meets the conservatorship requirements. Um, and we're certainly interested in that. Um, the challenge with any broadening of that legislation goes back to community capacity. So if we start putting more people under a conservatorship, um, it requires an expansion of that program, which is very expensive. Um, and it also requires community resources, additional community resources for placement. So many of the locked care facilities that we place our residents are actually out of county because we don't have in-county capacity to provide that level of care for folks. So I hope that answers your question. No, it does, and I, I recognize the complexity of it as well as just the um, thresholds, but I, I do think that many individuals that we observe on our streets here um, you know, do need some oversight, and, and I think, you know, I recognize that it has it's sort of a wait and fail model, right? You have to be so severely uh, disabled to not be able to get sort of that oversight of care, but it, it, um, it feels also like the humane thing to do. And so however we can advocate for a more flexible approach to get a conservative conservatorship for those individuals, you know, please keep us posted. Absolutely. Thank you. Council Member Matthews. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions, um, Eric, related to that very last slide you showed. Um, I was under the impression that the Bobby Pack program wasn't uh, working in, in effect anymore and that the FIT program had been put on hold 
for decommissions because of budget issues. Do I understand that incorrectly, or maybe you could just clarify that? And I have one other question. Sure, I'll answer the FIT program question first, and then I'm going to kick it over to James Russell around uh, how the PACT court is currently working. In terms of FIT, yes, when COVID hit the county, um, our work, our collaborative work with the sheriff's office was suspended. It wasn't because of budgetary reasons. Okay. It was because... Um, as I mentioned earlier, we relied heavily on the use of the jail um, to do these what we call flash incarceration. So if we're having multiple contacts with, with an individual who's behaving badly in the community, we had um, actually a section of the jail reserved for our use to be able to put folks in there and, and use some different strategies and engagement. Um, but with COVID and the risk for the spread of COVID within setting like that. Um, the use of the jail was suspended. And then simultaneously, the sheriff's deputies who were assigned to the program were also dealing with the fires um, yeah. and other high community needs. So at this point, we're still operating fit, but without, without our partnership with the sheriffs on the streets. But we're hoping that resumes at some point, or the program perhaps evolves into something else, um, because it was originally designed as a pilot program. With that, I'm going to kick it over to James to add anything I might have missed about FIT and then talk about the PACT court. Yeah, just uh, FIT clinicians continue to work out in the field um, to continue um, outreaching those folks who, there's a total of 90 that at any time were on the fit list. So any of those folks that need some type of case management on a limited basis or connection to other services, they're really trying to, to outreach that. Um, again, it was a focused deterrence uh, model, and so the deterrence part of it is not there, it's just the clinical component of it. Um, regarding the PAC court, it's continued to morph, but it, it is still in existence. Um, it, it, as many of the courts, it went dark for a little while at the outset mm -hmm. of COVID, but it has reinstated now. Um, some of the clients in there are the HOPES clients that uh, go through there. There has been a couple fit clients, and there's several people that aren't anyone's clients. They just end up mm -hmm. in the PAC court for review, and the um, uh, city attorney is very involved with that as well, I believe. Okay, and then I did have another question. Um, Council Member Watkins mentioned some of my concerns, um, those individuals, and we see, we all see them, and it just seems so gravely disabled that it, it seems inhuman that there's not a more active intervention. And I recall that the governor in his state of the state message earlier this year talked about needing a review of the criteria that they're, at least this was as he described it, so strict that they're actually cruel. So I would just appreciate your um, comments on that. And um, the other is about the multiple incarcerations. That, again, is another topic there. It's just, it seems like system we have is not working. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I sent around a message to a few people about um, a case that was reported to me from the community with someone with identifiable deep mental illness, referred to a safe hospital, told he would never be released, released because he was doing well on, on so-called on his meds and then continued to reoffend was contacted by a local resident when this guy was trespassing on his property. The guy says, I need help, <laughs> and, and was deeply confused. Now, I understand there's always multiple versions of any given story. I know that. And I know there's a back story. But, you know, we, these are the kinds of stories we hear over and over and over again, overlapping <laughs> with mental illness and substance abuse. And, and um, re-incarceration re for what appear to be minor offenses, re holes, et cetera. So frustrating to policymakers 
and frustrating to community, and I can't imagine they're not also frustrating to service providers. So. Yeah, so uh, I appreciate the comments. Um, I think part of the challenge in looking at kind of a downstream approach where we're responding to all these folks who are in a crisis is that we forget about the need for capacity upstream. Mm -hmm. um, so many of these folks don't have stable, safe, secure housing. Um, and it's, as you can imagine, extraordinarily difficult to think about or even engage in any treatment services um, when you're homeless on the street and you're constantly worrying about where you're going to get your next meal from or where you're going to sleep that night or whether or not you're going to be attacked by someone else on the street. And that's just a huge challenge for anyone doing homeless outreach. You know, we can have the conversation with someone about, hey, we have this treatment program available for you, but that's often the last thing on their minds. Um, and if we had the opportunity to take a more upstream approach and we had housing available for people to first provide them a stable, safe place to live, it then opens up a lot of doors and gives us the opportunity to engage them when they're not having to worry about being homeless. Um, and Karen and I have talked extensively about this, and, and we know what we need to do. Um, it's just we haven't been able to secure the funding or find locations to build these types of programs that our community so desperately needs. And I'm going to ask Karen to kind of fill in the blanks on anything I might have missed in response to that. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, as Chris and, and Christy noted in the very beginning, the, the homelessness is the key. If you can find housing for somebody, you can almost immediately change the trajectory of their uh, quality of life for the better. And there are a lot of models that are uh, proven to be um, quite effective uh, that are out there, but that do require that housing first, housing is healthcare type of approach. And I think that the more that we're able to secure um, low barrier uh, housing, you know, so not having to wait for a voucher um, or rise to the top of the uh, coordinated entry list through smart path assessment or, you know, wait for, um, you know, to have some sort of income coming through through your benefits if you're applying for benefits to be able to pay rent in a, in a regular housing situation that might accept you with your issues. You know, we need to have low barrier, quick access housing. And I think that, um, for example, Eric and I were talking about an SRO model, which uh, I come from up in Portland. We've had a tremendous success up there, integrating clinic services into housing, making sure that people have all the services that they have wrapped around them. And that is really where you're gonna start seeing the most success as long as people who are on the street, uh, it's very challenging for them to take uh, and partake of and participate in continuously any kind of treatment services. And then I would say coupled with that is the availability of the right dose of the right kind of treatment at the right time. So meeting somebody's readiness for, uh, you know, yes, it's time for me to want to change my life. And I think that one last thing, the uh, comorbidity of substance use disorder with mental health is extremely high. Um, people use substances to um, self-medicate. Um, the um, substances may be masking their mental health symptoms. They may be exacerbating their mental health systems. And so unless you have a co-occurring approach to care, you're often left with treating one or the other, but not both. And so that makes it equally challenging. So one other thing that I wanted to mention, and, and I've done some work with our human services department on this, and it was borne out by um, some data that we reviewed for folks that we were having contacts with in the community. There is this other group of people who tend to be um, very difficult and engaging. And what we found with a number of them is they actually have a history of a traumatic brain injury. 
And for those folks who have a traumatic brain injury after the age of 18, there's really no one responsible for them. And as hard as we can try in providing behavioral health services or substance use treatment services, it really isn't what they need and what they're going to respond to. And there's this unique group of people that, um, you know, they don't, they don't fit in to any one service provider. Um, there, is, there are regional centers throughout the state that focus and have the expertise in working with that population, but only if the traumatic brain injury occurred before age 18. Um, so there was legislation to do a study committee on this. I don't know what ended up happening to that. I think COVID and the budget, state budget derailed that process, but um, there was a lot of interest from other counties and the governor's office in taking a closer look at this because we have this group of people who are really struggling out in the community and they don't qualify or fit into any of our existing systems to provide care to them. All right. Thanks for that information. So moving on, uh, we'll go to Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Um, well, so many questions. I'll try to keep them brief. Um, thank you for the um, the overview. And I, you know, I kind of have been trying to draw out. Um, what I would appear to be responsive to the question I asked the first uh, group of speakers about the biggest challenges and obstacles to um, getting your work done effectively. Um, so I have a couple, so my question's kind of around the, the question of referral capacity. Um, it seems to me that um, a lot of the challenge is related to that. So regardless of where people are at, I mean, there's the siloing of services challenge, um, you know, and, ha and the pathways um, that, that don't necessarily fit, you know, with the messiness of where, pe you know, people's experience and um, condition. Uh, but then there's the capacity. And so a lot of the conversation is about making these referrals. And then, um, but then we don't have, like, I mean, I, my understanding is we don't have bed space for, uh, you know, people who want to go into treatment. We don't have, I mean, we really have very little supportive housing. All of these are knowns, and yet would be the answer is to, you know, build more and resource them so that they, you know, they can provide those services. But I guess I'm just, I'd like to get a lay of the land, because I think this is something that the public really also needs to understand. Um, what is available for, you know, there's, we get messages, like so many messages, you know, these people all need to go to treatment and, you know, with, you know, uh, without uh, uh, editorializing on the um, kind of limited <laughs> nature of the, the response, um, you know, what, like, so what does that look like? I mean, how, where, is there, you know, if somebody need, wants to go into treatment, is there a place for them to go um, with respect to the relationship with the jail? Um, and the loss of that, um, and I have some questions about that that are, I'll say for a second or a moment, but um, like the sobering center's closed, you know, I'm just trying to understand like where do people go? Where, where are you gonna send people if they're not, um, you know, jail ready or, uh, you know, and I, I, I don't really feel this way about it, I'm sorry for lack of a better shorthand, jail ready or hospital ready, um, you know, what do you, where do, what's the capacity, where can people go? Where can you send them? Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to share that perspective, uh, my perspective on that, and I'll also ask members of my team to chime in as well. Um, you know, I think we have capacity, if you look at a continuum of care, so least restrictive setting to most restrictive setting, we have capacity that's been built on either end. Um, so we are heavily reliant on using independent housing um, in the community, so working with people to find an apartment in the community and then we bring supports to them. And then on the other end, um, locked care settings and inpatient psychiatric units that we can admit people to if they're an imminent risk to themselves or others. 
but a lot of what's missing is everything in between. Um, so for the person that needs residential care that has 24-7 staffing available to them on site, we have very little capacity in that area. Um, intensive supported housing services for people who are living independently in the community where we have enough staff to see that person every single day, twice a day if needed, to support their independent living, that we don't have enough capacity of. It's, it's all of those things in between that are lacking. Um, even the housing stock availability, you know, on the low end of the continuum, affordable housing that's safe and secure for our folks, they are competing with everybody else in the county for housing. And it's very difficult, even if they have, have the fortunate luck of getting a housing voucher that will support their rent, uh, it's very difficult to find them an apartment um, when they might be competing with 50 or 100 other people for that same apartment. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, the perennial problem of housing. Uh, so in terms of the relationship with law enforcement, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit more about that because it sounds like um, the so you're you're no longer uh, no longer have that relationship with the jail for um, your is it fit is it fit um, fit folks? program yeah oh, I, sorry it's in that sip I uh, keeping the acronym straight uh, so if, but but you're continuing to provide some kind of service so if um, I mean can you see a way forward for that type of program? to continue without law enforcement participation? I mean, I think that's one of the things that we are all talking about is ways to um, kind of separate, uh, you know, non, uh, non-violent um, emergency response um, or non-life-threatening emergency response. Um, and I know sometimes it's hard to know um, in the moment, right, where that's gonna go. But just, you know, how to, how to, how to do that without, um, having the jail as a place for yeah. system, right? So what are your thoughts on that? So the FIT program, no, because FIT is actually a public safety program. So we're providing the mental health, the behavioral health support to law enforcement, but without law enforcement, it's, it's without the sheriff's deputies present, it's not a public safety program anymore. So if it's not going to ultimately continue, um, we have some extremely skilled, well-qualified staff who are in the FIT program that we will likely have to move elsewhere. And there's lots of places we could put them and um, we'll have those discussions internally and with our stakeholders. But, um, you know, if, if a decision's made not to continue FIT, um, there's certainly some opportunities to use those staff given their skill set in other areas. They're most similar to our mental health liaisons, and we've heard repeatedly from law enforcement that they would like to expand capacity in that program, particularly in South County, because we only have one currently. And James, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, I just was gonna say that definitely during this time of COVID, the jail is not, we never use the jail for mentally, individuals who are suffering from mental illness. That is not the goal and that's, um, that has never been used for that. If folks are committing crimes, in which again, we would like to circumvent someone who has a mental illness, that being how it's being um, portrayed in the community is, is that they're loitering or you know trespassing, acting out in a way. Um, we wanna try and get that taken care of before it results in some type of jail thing. Anyone going to jail right now is only going because it's a repetitive, It's going to continue unless they re the officer removes that individual from the scene. Um, because of COVID, it's sight and release pretty much on misdemeanors, um, which all those crimes um, are. 
Um, so again, in FIT, in and of itself, no one is on the FIT team unless they met a, a pretty high bar for being very aggressive individuals or history of violence um, on their records. So again, they weren't just put on FIT. The majority of the folks are not um, diagnosed with severe mental illness or on FIT. It's, it's purely behavioral um, and, and again, rises to that level of concern in the community. Yeah, that's a great point, James, that's important to make is that if we are working with someone in the community who has a serious mental illness and they're in crisis, the last place we want them in is a jail. Um, so we're going to look to put that person in a psychiatric hospital. Um, sometimes they end up at the jail because of the severity of charges, so if they've done a very violent assault. They may ultimately end up at the jail, but that's when our jail crisis intervention team steps in and we provide the supports and the assessment um, and treatment to the person while they remain at the jail so that they don't remain unsupported while they're there. Thank you. And last question. Um, why did the sober and separate club with this COVID related program? I know it was operated through contract with Janice, but perhaps you can shed some light on that. Yeah, the sobering center, it's another example of a thing that we would need and don't have anymore. Um, it was funded originally through a grant, is my understanding, and with the, with the budget challenges that presented themselves, um, that contract Janice had with the sheriff's office was ended, um, so the program ultimately closed. Thank you. You're welcome. I have um, two quick questions, and then we'll open up briefly for public comment and then move on to our last presentation. Um, the first question I had was, so what's the best way for people, you know, we have this mobile emergency response team. I guess if you know someone were facing some kind of a crisis, is there a number they could call so that those people could, you know, go out and address the concern? Or how is I guess how is that team deployed? Yeah, we have so many different programs um, through the county and with our our nonprofits. It would be hard for anyone to navigate which number to call. Um, so calling our main access number um, is the best and easiest way to connect with any of our programs and services. And they'll screen the call and connect the caller um, or person making a referral to the right team and program. And that number can be found on our website. Thanks. And then the second question I had, um, I'm not sure if people realize that there's a there's what's called the um, Institute for Mental Disease Exclusion, and um, I know recently the Support Act was passed, I think, in 2018. But the the history behind the Institute for Mental Disease Exclusion is that it pretty much says if you have more than 16 beds in a facility that are designated for mental health um, response, then you, if any more than 16, then the federal government won't provide Medicaid funds, is my understanding. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, because I think that, you know, we keep wanting to have more beds, but there's actual, you know, limitations at the federal level, and some of which have been relaxed, it sounds like, um, but I'm just wondering if maybe you could speak to that and how that affects our ability to have um, sure. mental health beds. Yeah, not much has been relaxed. Um, hopefully with a new administration, we might see some more flexibility, but those regulations have been around for decades at this point. Yes, so the, the IMD exclusion, um, to which it's referred to in the federal Medicaid program, prohibits us from collecting any federal matching funds for a freestanding psychiatric program that's greater than 16 beds. So our local inpatient program, our psychiatric health facility is 16 beds. Um, if there were no IMD exclusion, it 
would potentially be larger than 16 beds, but anything bigger than that, we get no federal funds. Um, so for every dollar that we put in locally using local county funds or state realignment funds or MHSA funds, we're generally able to leverage a dollar of federal funds. So we kind of double the impact of those local and state dollars. And we can't afford to open up a program that's subject to the IMD exclusion because we would have to pay the full cost with those local and state dollars. So instead of the federal government picking up half the cost, it would pick up zero of the cost. And interestingly, when we signed up for the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system waiver, which dramatically expanded substance use disorder treatment services in the community, our residential programs were subject to the same IMD exclusion. And prior to signing up for the for the ODS waiver, we were paying the full cost of those residential beds. And as part of the federal waiver that the state of California applied for, they also applied for a waiver to the IMD for any substance use disorder treatment beds. Um, so that allowed us to build and expand upon our residential treatment programs on the SUD side without having to worry about that IMD exclusion. We have not had the same flexibility on the mental health side. There are some um, opportunities with a new federal waiver to um, apply to um, exclude our psychiatric beds from that IMD exclusion, but what the federal government always wants to see is revenue neutrality. So. When the state applies for a new waiver, which our current waiver ended in December and it was just extended, um, they have to show revenue neutrality. So if you're going to have more flexibility in one area that's going to cost the federal government more, you have to be able to demonstrate that there will be cost savings in another area. And that's been a challenge for California to do when they've considered applying for more flexibility under this IMD waiver. We'd have to show that we're going to be spending less somewhere else so that the federal government wouldn't be spending more by granting the waiver. Gotcha. Thanks. That's really helpful information. Um, so those are all the questions I had. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to briefly open it up um, for public comment. So if there are members of the public who would like to comment on uh, the presentation that was just provided by the county, now's the time to call in using the number that's on your screen. Once you've dialed in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes to speak. Hey, this is uh, Reggie calling in again. Um, I was curious about where, like, the Benchlands encampment fits into these models. Um, if someone is living in an encampment, uh, does that uh, allow us to get uh, certain types of federal funding? Um, since it is so much cheaper, uh, how much does that expand the uh, number of people who can get access to resources? Um, it seemed like Benchlands encampment had a pretty high uh, number of people who could be served with a very wide variety of wraparound services was my understanding. So I'm wondering um, what that looks like in the broader uh, system of services. Thanks. Thank sure, and I'll, I'll try to answer as much of that as I can. Um, again, because our focus is not necessarily on providing services to the homeless. Um, our other team actually supports services at the Benchlands, and that's the Homeless Persons Health Project. And I would really encourage the council to perhaps arrange for a future presentation by HPHP. Um, they're the ones that are out at the Benchlands um, supporting both the medical and behavioral health needs of the people living there. Um, 
So other than that, we tend to get called in if, if there's a crisis occurring and they need our MERT team or our mental health liaisons to respond and evaluate the person for a 5150 hold. Um, but James, Karen, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add to that. This is Adam Novak again. Um, I was wondering, like you mentioned that there's like a one main dispatch number for the, the mental health services. Why isn't that connected to 911, the sort of poll calls that could be addressed by a mental health response? Um, our mental health liaisons are actually connected to 911, and I can ask James to give the details on how they respond via 911. But the, the liaisons go out with the cops, right? Like, can you send out the MERT from 911? We do not send out MERT from 911, no. The way our system is set up is they do a co-response with law enforcement. And James, did right. you want to provide some detail on how that response works? Yeah, so I'll go back to the original question in that it, it, the 800 number for county behavioral health is not a dispatch number. It, it's more of a triage number where you're calling in to access services or to ask some general questions related to what might be happening in the moment with you or a family member related to mental health. So again, it's a triage number, and that person triaging might say, wow, this sounds like you're in the middle of an emergency right now that is very emergent that you need to call 911, and let me help you do that. Um, or they might say, hey, can you get this individual down to the clinic, um, and we'll set things up so that you can have an appointment in the next couple hours or whatever. Um, or meet with a Merck clinician, or if it's at a secure site, the, the Merck team will go to that site to meet with the individual. So again, it's not a dispatch number, it is a triage number to access the appropriate level of services or consultation. Hope that answered that. And James, how does the mental health liaisons get dispatched? So the mental health liaisons are always going to be dispatched in, as um, the caller indicated, they will be dispatched with a police officer. Um, sometimes those calls can be triaged um, without responding, i.e. they can call up on the phone um, and settle things over the phone because it might not have been uh, a true emergent um, need in the moment. It was just something that might have been going that way. So they can handle things over the phone. But otherwise, if it is an in-person response, the mental health liaison is responding with law enforcement. All right, next caller. Hi, my name is Sherry Miller. And I have a question for Eric. It regards the IMD exclusion. It's most likely a very naive. Carrie, I'm going to ask question. you if you can turn your. Carrie, I'm going to ask if you can turn your, um, whatever device you're streaming or watching on. Just if you can turn that down, that way we can uh, we won't get the echo. And it looks like you might have muted yourself or hung up. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, my apology. I thought I unmuted, I guess I didn't. I just have a question for Eric regarding the Mental Health Services Act funding pertain to prudent reserve that's sitting there. It's my understanding there's millions of dollars that's just sitting there not being utilized. And I think we need to utilize to meet the needs of the mental health community by tapping into the prudent reserve. Second 
comment I have regarding the Homeless Persons Health Project. I have extreme reservation regarding that program. I've had personal experience working with homeless individuals where the staff pick and choose who gets help and who doesn't get help. This particular program, everyone is not treated equally. Thank you. Uh, I can't answer the question around HPHP. Again, it's it's not within my division at all. It's within our clinics division, so they would be better equipped to, to answer that question. In terms of the prudent reserve that you mentioned with our Mental Health Service Act funds, those are funds that each county is required to set aside a certain percentage of their funding um, in the event of a state budget crisis. Um, we have not yet received permission um, from the Department of Healthcare Services to tap into those prudent reserve funds. Um, so they are not accessible to us at this point, but um, our county as well as the other counties continues to work on uh, advocating for that should we need it and setting up a process with the state to be able to access those prudent reserve funds. But again, they are funds that we're required to set aside and hold, and we cannot tap into them to spend without specific state approval. All right, next caller. Hello, my name is Katayun, and I'm a um, tier, dedicated volunteer at Food Not Bombs. Um, I would like to, first of all, thank everyone who's working in the mental health um, services for everything that they do in our community and just comment on seconding someone's comment previously about 50% of police being, 50% um, of the police budget being for patrolling and those funds could very well be reallocated probably to things like Housing First for our community as well as tapping into resources like UCSD, hotels and motels and increasing vouchers for that. And um, on top of that, just trying to re-divert people away from the uh, criminal system and into housing and mental health. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next caller. This is Sarah Ringler. I've been listening to the, the presentation, and uh, um, I guess what I'm most gratified to hear is what I think we already know, that we need housing. Uh, all your experts are saying, you know, despite the needs for mental health and substance abuse, abuse the main thing, people need housing. So um, I, I appreciate, and I think that's a really clear message, and it's no big surprise. I guess my other comment would be this idea of making it easier to have guardianship or conservatorship by taking away a person's legal rights. I'd much rather rather they have a house first. So uh, could our council really work on that and really increase the amount of housing available? Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I'm going to close public comment because it looks like there's no other individuals who want to address uh, the council or have questions on this topic. And so with that, if there's, I guess, uh, to close it out, is there any other comments from council members or questions at this time? Okay, seeing none, um, I'd like to thank you all for that wonderful presentation, this discussion around the efforts of the county um, to address mental health, substance abuse, and hopefully we can continue these conversations moving forward. Thank you. Um, so with that, uh, let's take a short, about a 10-minute break. We'll come back at 3.30, and then we'll have our final presentation um, for this afternoon. Exactly.
we can go ahead and get started with the last item. I am here, it's Renee. All right, so again, if council members, if you're back at your desk, if you can please, or in front of your device, if you can please turn on the video and we can see everyone's back, we can go ahead and get started. Mayor, did you hear that I was here, Renee? No? Yes, we did. I can hear you right now. Okay. <laughs> Thank talk about cahoots, but also sort of 
starts the imagination process of what it might look like for a CAHOOTS program to come to Santa Cruz, um, both in the city and also maybe the surrounding areas as well. So back in 1989, uh, the, the 911 system was very new, four or five years old. It hadn't been around very long. And the city of Eugene was about to hire two new police officers because they had a very low police officer to, pop, to population ratio. And so they came, the city council came and said, we're going to hire two new police officers uh, unless somebody has a, a better idea. And um, at, that, at that time, the executive director of Whitebird Clinic said, you know, we've been running this 24-hour phone and walk-in crisis center for about 20 years now. And a lot of times we have people that we'd like to go meet with them in the community because they, are, they don't have the ability to come to us. Um, they don't have the money. They don't have transportation. They're scared to ride the bus, that kind of stuff. And so he said... Um, so he said, you know, we were thinking maybe it'd be cool to have a crisis assistance team, like our crisis center, who would help out on the streets. Um, and, and, and you could maybe put us into the 911 system and give us radios just like the police and the fire department. And, and the city council said, well, yeah, that sounds kind of cool, you know, so they agreed, and that was how CAHOOTS was born. Uh, White Bird was started and run by, you know, the counterculture in the 60s, a lot of hippies. So they thought it was really funny. The, the, they thought the acronym CAHOOTS because they were in CAHOOTS with the cops, so they thought it was hilarious. Um, and, and that's really how it was born. And, and now what you see with CAHOOTS is, is it's grown significantly, it's, um, changed quite a bit, and has become uh, significantly more um, comprehensive and robust in, in how we respond to things. But this picture that you see here in the background, um, this is a very typical CAHOOTS call. Uh, there's a young man, his name is Christian, he's an EMT, and a young woman, her name is Ashley, she's a crisis counselor, and they're just um, checking on this person who's asleep on the, on the sidewalk. Um, you know, it's Eugene, it's probably pretty cold, it's not, it doesn't look to be too cold, but it's probably pretty cold still. Uh, that, you know, they're making sure this person has food, water, um, if they are intoxicated, maybe they might want to go to the sobering center for a little bit of a warmer spot to sleep. Uh, maybe they're sick, they need to take them to the hospital, um, they can check their vitals, uh, you know, offer them any kind of services if they want to go to the shelter for the night and there's uh, availability there, they can take them, and so on. So, um, Cahoots is Cahoots, and, and ultimately Cahoots is not interested in franchising our mod ourselves out to other cities. So we're kind of thinking more about what our model is. So I'm, I, throughout the presentation, I'll refer to our model as the Mobile Crisis Intervention Services, or MCIS model. Um, I might also just refer to it as Kahoot style mobile crisis as well. Um, so those two things are essentially the same. As I said, it's a, a new model for first response. However, it has been around for 30 years. Um, but the idea is just is sort of just starting to catch hold in, in other places, including Olympia, Denver, Oakland, um, somewhat San Francisco with their new program. Portland is going to be implementing um, a, a very robust uh, $5 million program um, to cover the whole city there and um, based on our model. So it's, it's catching hold and, and growing. So what it is. So MCIS is a non-emergency first response to residents experiencing mental health, substance use, and homelessness-related crises. Uh, when people ask what CAHOOTS is, in a, in a very simple nutshell, that's, that's what it is. That's, that's who we are. Um, basically, you have any one of those kinds of crises, and you call for assistance, and you'll get uh, this fellow here. You'll get Matt um, and a partner of his and, instead of uh, the police or the fire department. So what do we do? Um, we really alleviate the burden that has been placed on police and the fire and EMS systems to manage crises that derive from emotional distress, substance use, and homelessness. Uh, a lot of the conversation around policing today is about the immense burden that we have placed on that, that system to manage things um, in these uh, areas. And so CAHOOTS and, and a mobile crisis team like CAHOOTS is really geared to alleviate that burden. We also try to de-escalate situations that are potentially very volatile um, that could escalate to the point where they need police or they need fire and EMS. Um, and we try to sort of head those off early on. 
The how it works. Uh, as I mentioned already, there's an EMT and a crisis counselor. Um, I, when I worked uh, on the van and I was on the streets, I, I started out as a crisis counselor and then I got my EMT license. Um, so I worked both roles. That's called a, a cross-trained person. And you can see this is just another team in action here. Um, there's a, Oregon is very wet. Um, I, I imagine Santa Cruz being next to the ocean probably has a lot of similar issues with people who live on the street having a lot of um, trench foot and things like that, wounds that need to be taken care of because of the, the moisture in the air. Um, this man, uh, his name is Manning, he's doing uh, wound care, probably on somebody's feet, and this woman is the crisis counselor, and she's just hanging out and making sure no one bothers them while they're doing that, giving, helping them have their privacy. So the crisis counselor does a lot of things. Uh, they do suicide assessments and interventions, um, kind of family mediations, just general de-escalation of people who might be very upset set and very overwhelmed, feeling kind of out of control. Uh, they, they are, we ask a lot of them. They, they, they need to be very multi-talented, multi-skilled, and they also need to be very good at connecting with people very quickly. The EMTs are a fantastic resource for us because what they allow us to do is they allow us to determine whether or not somebody's mental health symptoms are in fact deriving from some kind of physical health issue. So for example, people who are, are hypoglycemic and they're diabetic, sometimes they can seem intoxicated or maybe just kind of a little out of it and maybe they seem like they're having some kind of mental health episode, but actually you check their blood sugar, it's 40, 50, 60, and we know, okay, this is actually hypoglycemia, very simple fix. The EMT allows us to manage those kinds of situations without having to take the person to the hospital or to call the fire department. Uh, similarly, when we're on a mental health call, let's say somebody who's self-harmed, who's um, cut their arms or something like that, the EMT wound, take care of that kind of stuff without having to get a bunch of people involved, which can be very overwhelming for the patient. Uh, and every once in a while, you have some calls that might just go sideways, and um, somebody might go unconscious or overdose or something like that, and the EMT is there to help us with that, those types of situations. So the EMT is really a, a distinctive part of our kind of mobile crisis intervention style. Um, another distinctive part is that we are accessed, and we are not law enforcement, but we are accessed the same way that law enforcement and the fire department is accessed, which is you can get us through the 911 or non-emergency phone call system. Um, the vast majority of our calls come from the non-emergency number. Um, however, some people who don't have enough money to pay for, for their phone bills that still want to get us, they can call 911 because it's free um, and, and, then, and access us that way. Just like police and fire, the call takers take the calls, the dispatchers qualify, prioritize, and then send us as, um, accordingly as we need to go wherever we need to go. So the welfare check is our primary type of call. Um, that's the thing we do the most of. Uh, and this can be on a wide, range, wide array of people, um, for people sleeping in the park, people who are not returning phone calls, people making vague and oftentimes also explicit suicidal statements via text or social media. I know Santa Cruz is um, you know, as a, a university town, just like Eugene. Uh, a lot of times these can be students uh, whose parents maybe you know, have some conversations with their, their young one and um, they can't really, you know, they don't know who to send, they don't know what to call, they don't want to call the cops, they can send code. Um, people who are unseen by neighbors with mail building up, there's some concern that maybe they've, uh, they're deceased inside. And then just generally, you know, your everyday run-of-the-mill person screaming on the side of the corner. Um, they're not breaking any laws, they're not doing anything, you know, dangerous, but somebody should check on them. That would be a Cahoots call, mobile crisis call. So a little bit about welfare checks in Santa Cruz city and county. About 22% of all the police department calls are welfare checks. Um, in 2020, um, so far, the sheriff's office has um, had anywhere between 43 and 56% of all their calls as welfare checks. Uh, and these two combined are about 30,000 calls per year. Um, 
a mobile crisis team, an MCIS team could handle a large portion of these. And, and this would allow for faster police response times to emergencies, because a lot of these types of calls are non-emergent, they're not, um, they don't require uh, emergency responders. And as we'll see later, um, based on the CPSM report back in 2017, 2018, uh, those, those, those calls actually take the police a long time to respond to. Um, and so this would actually create a faster response time um, for those types of situations. So who receives services? Everyone, everyone receives services. Um, I think CAHOOTS is often portrayed and some, some people portray us as being a great response to homelessness, and that is very true. Other people portray us as a great response to mental health calls, and that is also true. Uh, but the reality is that we focus on, on all of those things, on both of those things and, and, and much more. Um, we're very similar. We're a first responder team. We're a crisis response team. We're very similar to the police and the fire in the sense that it doesn't matter who you are. If you're within the city limits, you can get a, you can have us come out to you. So people living on the street, people with um, who are feeling suicidal, family members in dispute, um, but a lot of group home, uh, permanent supportive housing, board and cares, all those types of uh, resources. Uh, access us very frequently. Uh, the shelter in Eugene, we have a great relationship with them. Um, they call us multiple times a day, and we have a little bit of a you scratch our back, we'll scratch yours relationship. Uh, we provide them with uh, a lot of support, and then they allow us to bring people in to the shelter after hours, even sometimes when they don't really have room. Um, they'll make room for us, so that's really nice. Um, there's a lot of talk around sort of like race and 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 the coots model. So I guess I just want to point out a couple things. One is that just by our sort of existence, we do we do prevent police interactions with Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, who are experiencing mental health crises. It's just kind of by default. Um, that's something we do. It's also good, it's good work. It's a good job. Um, we also don't we don't rely on the Western model of mental health. Uh, we can we are conversant in it, um, so we can talk to you about you know your experience of being bipolar or schizophrenic. But if you're somebody from um, a different ethnicity or different cultural background who doesn't think of their experiences that way, we're not necessarily, we don't have to talk to you um, about those types of things in that way. We can just help you and support you with however you want to interpret your own um, experiences. And it's also really exciting community work um, that, that I think is important for people uh, who that they might not have the opportunity um, so much uh, because they may not want to join the police or the fire department. Talk a little bit about outcomes. Um, these are most common interventions, although I've mentioned almost all of these already. I think some, some important ones to, to point out uh, are transportation to staff services. So we take people to the shelter, the urgent care, the emergency room, the crisis center, sobering center, um, clinics, and on and on. We take people all over the place. Um, you know, we transport them to get food, to get water, to get you know meals, um, any kinds of things like that. Uh, we also have a really great relationship with the local food bank in town. We're called a mobile food pantry. They give us a couple of. Um, pallets of food uh, every couple of weeks, and then we're able to hand that out to people who are food insecure because they're living on the street or because they just are economically um, food insecure due to their income. A little bit about our relationship with the police. We do have a, a really good relationship with the police in both cities, um, both Eugene and in Springfield. Uh, and some, th there's a recent Eugene Police Department report that I do want to highlight that um, showed that we're diverting somewhere between eight and ten percent of all police calls. Um, and and that in uh, in 2019, of the tens of thousands of calls that we took, um, only 24 of them ended with the police responding to us uh, code three, which is say with lights and sirens. Um, so. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the safety of, of CAHOOTS and, and how it is that we can do this safely. Um, I think this shows that very, very infrequently um, 
are we uh, in emergency situations where our lives are at risk? Almost never. And in 31 years, um, no cahoots worker has ever been injured on the job. Um, no one's ever been stabbed or shot or anything like that. Um, I will say I've been, I have been punched by a 90 pound uh, woman who was very intoxicated. So that was, um, you know, very difficult, but sometimes that happens and it comes with the job, but, uh, but, but no one's ever been very hurt. Um, 86 percent of all of our responses did not involve police at all. Um, so the vast majority of what we're doing does not have police inv involvement. And of those, those calls that do involve the police or do involve the fire department, um, very, very frequently those are the police or the fire department calling for us and not calling us calling for them. So like I said, very, very few times um, are they, are they request, are we requesting them for assistance. So one of our key kind of work, the key kind of work that we do is our responses to suicidality. Um, uh, just under 70% of what we do uh, d with our suicide interventions is us alone with no police involvement. Um, the other percentage that involves the police or the fire department, um, again, those are calls where we're either being sent out with them or they're calling for us after the fact. Um, and 64% uh, of all of our suicidal interventions did not involve us taking people to the hospital. Um, we were able to sort of handle those types of calls in the person's home or on the street with the person. Um, sometimes we do them in businesses or therapists' offices as well. Uh, and, and a large, large proportion of them, we don't end up doing any kind of hospital visit. Uh, we, we were very proud of these numbers. Um, last year we did almost, we did just over 2,000 calls with some kind of suicidality. You can see here um, Ashley and Christian again uh, on, a, on a regular crisis call. And you can see this is, um, this is in a restaurant of some kind uh, or some kind of a cafeteria. So really common for, um, you know, for these types of calls to happen just out in the community. Um, I do want to uh, just point out something from the CPSM report um, with uh, Santa Cruz and thinking about what a mobile crisis team might look like and what kinds of calls they could hopefully divert from um, police so they can have more time to do their emergency calls. Um, from the CPSM report, almost 6,500 or 13.7% of all the community initiated calls for service. Uh, we're, some, we're basically a CAHOOTS call, which is um, assist citizen uh, in, in Eugene, we call those public assists, um, just a check, we call those welfare checks, and then um, medical or mental health uh, uh, calls. In that report, it states uh, most of this effort is an inappropriate use of emergency personnel, uh, that, which is to say these types of calls. Uh, welfare checks used up, um, and welfare checks alone used up approximately 6,500 officer hours. Um, another great quote from that report that I thought was really important, the city has defaulted the handling of almost all social ills in the city to the police department, especially those dealing with the homeless population. Through the focus groups conducted with the department supervisors and line level personnel, it was obvious there's a high level of frustration among all employees regarding the level of responsibility of dealing with the homelessness issue. I think this is really critical um, when thinking about a CAHOOTS model for your city um, because that frustration is uh, real in probably all cities and we really exist to try to alleviate that frustration to really help um, the, the police departments and the fire departments to focus their energies on, on other things. And then finally, here's um, a, a quote from Chief Mills' blog. I recently spoke with a sergeant about disfunding. He said, if somebody could take the homeless issues entirely from us and stop us from responding to mental health calls, please take the money. The sad reality is that no one else has stepped up as the first responder to those issues. And um, I think that mainly what, what's being said there is that it's hard to know what, the, what a good model would be for this. How do you, how do you structure it? And, um, and we think that we have a really great model for that. So keep going on. Um, medical outcomes, we, we uh, do approximately 3,000 or more emergency room diversions um, every year, uh, 2,000 or so ambulance diversions, and we take about 
these are these are 2017 numbers. Um, they're kind of low. We expanded our hours since then, so these numbers are probably higher now. Um, we did find that last year we saved between the fire and EMS, Medicaid, CCO, and hospitals combined, we saved approximately 8.5 million local community dollars. Um, and and I also want to point out here this photo, um, which I think gives a really good image about what a Hoots van looks like from the inside and also sort of illustrates some of our safety measures that we put in place for ourselves um, in order to keep us safe while doing the work. So here's the patient compartment. What you see here is the patient compartment. This is a fiberglass barrier. It's only accessible from the cab side, so it can't be opened from the patient compartment. Uh, it's, a, it's a roomy space, um, but it's got plastic walls, plastic seats. Um, it's very easy to clean uh, and um, very, you know, very good to, for people to lay down in, or we can store bicycle, you know, store. We can transport bicycles um, and all that kind of stuff. And you can see this one woman here, her name is Niles, she's, um, she, she's grabbing hold of this door, so there's no handle on the door. So once a patient's in the back of the van, the only way they can be let out is by us. Um, this is for their safety as well as ours. Uh, it, it, you know, the people who are experiencing psychosis or things like that may be at risk to get out of the van while it's moving um, or, or something dangerous of that, of that nature. So we don't trap anybody in there. If they request to be let out, we stop and we let them out. Uh, but that's a one way that we um, practice safety. So to look a, a look a little bit of numbers, um, the Eugene Springfield population is about 230,000. So between those two cities, it's just a little bit smaller than the entire county of Santa Cruz. Um, that being said, the city of Springfield itself is almost identical in size to the city of Santa Cruz. And we took about 6,500 calls last year in Springfield. Um, it, it, to compare that a little bit to um, what we said earlier with the, let's say, like the mental health liaison um, program, they were taking just over 3,000 calls total in the entire county. So um, we're doing about double the amount of calls, just a little over double amount of calls in the city of Springfield than um, the, that, that program is throughout the entire county. And that's partly because we are very uh, a very efficient model um, because we are first responders and not, um, not as much second responders. And um, also because we just are, are integrated into the system. Uh, I'm, I'm pointing this out. I don't want to be, not to do this to be controversial, just saying because uh, I think people will be interested in this. Um, a little bit about how much I think it would cost to run a mobile crisis team. Um, and just to point this to show that it really is not that much um, money and, uh, and, and could be implemented fairly cheaply. Um, just to c uh, give a little comparison to the uh, Santa Cruz Police Department. So a mobile crisis team, I think, this is my sort of estimations based on how much the cost of living and how much uh, social service workers and EMTs get paid in the area, um, would cost you about $1.5 million for a 24-hour unit to run 365 days a year. Um, this would come to a total of about $23 per, per resident of the city of Santa Cruz. And it would look at, it, they could probably take somewhere between ten and $15,000, which would come to about $150 per call. Um, the, the Santa Cruz Police Department is a very busy police department. They respond to a lot of calls every year um, in comparison to cities of other of similar size. Uh, they're actually responding to probably more than, than, than most typical police departments do. Um, so they, uh, they seem like they're very busy the more I look at their numbers. Uh, I, must be, I think it's probably pretty overwhelming. So um, the main, main primary sort of uh, uh, other type of crisis response in, in the country is really is the co-response model. Uh, about 2,200 cities around the country utilize the co-response model, and we've already heard a little bit about that. The mental health liaison model is that. Um, so one is that the, the mobile crisis with the CUTSA, we're not coercive. So we don't do any involuntary holds. We don't do 5150s. Um, we try to do a wide array of, of, of services, a wider, a wider array, and that, that is partly why we have the EMT 
um, but also we have why we do family disputes and that kind of stuff. Stuff that most co-response models don't handle. Um, we are cheaper um, in the long run because we don't use licensed clinicians. We also have that medical component. And then ultimately we do divert the police um, because the co-response model is police with somebody else. Um, which means that the police still have to go out on those types of calls. So um, this is a this is a story. It's a really good example, I think, of where the uh, the co-response team um, do a really good job, and at the same time, um, where mobile crisis intervention services would be more efficient and would um, provide a, a, a cheaper and, and and better result. So here's, this out is the West Hollywood Sheriff's Station, um, and the West Hollywood co-response team is called the Met, um, and they they responded to a man. He was 65 years old, recently homeless. Um, he'd never been on the street before, and the sheriff met with him, called the Met, the co-response team, called the paramedics. So by my count, they've got at least eight people out here um, responding to this one fellow. Um, there's four things that happen. There's the first response, there's the mental evaluation, the, me the medical, the physical health evaluation, and the transport. All of those services could be handled by a coot style mobile crisis team. Uh, the way that, that the LA Sheriff's Department estimates this kind of a call, it would cost them, with the paramedics and the sheriffs and the Met, it would cost about $3,900 um, to have that huge response to this one fellow. Um, but with a, a coot style mobile crisis team, you could do it for, you know, on average, about 150 Finally, I just want to make a sort of a, a, um, a little bit of an analogy and what our sort of model, how our model works, um, which is to say that we're a paraclinical model. So paramedics are not doctors, right? Paramedics that ride around on ambulances, but they're very skilled at being able to assess if someone needs to see a doctor. Similarly, CAHOOTS is not licensed clinicians. We're not, we're not like master's level people with licenses, but we're very skilled at being able to say this person should or should not go see a licensed clinician. And that's really kind of, sim that's, we're, we're very similar to the ambulance model that way. We are a triage and a transport type of unit um, designed specifically so that we can be more efficient in how we allocate our resources um, rather than, and, than sort of making, sending out the doctors to the people, um, determining who really needs to see a doctor the most and then um, efficiently getting them to that situation. Okay, so um, th you know, thank you so much for, for listening to, uh, to this uh, presentation. I love giving these presentations. I love talking with folks about this. And I'm really looking forward to um, all your questions and, and you know, um, seeing, talking more about, about what the model is and, and, and how it works and, and anything that you might be interested in knowing, I'd be really happy to answer. Great, thanks, Ben, for that that presentation. Um, very informative and good to see how you know other cities are are trying to approach um, mental health crisis response. Uh, so I'll go ahead and open it up to council members to see if any council members had questions at this time. Council Member Matthews. Thanks, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, there are a very interesting presentation. I appreciate it. Um, my understanding is that this is a program that operates out of existing clinics, do I understand that correctly, and that your service area is the Eugene and Springfield um, metro area, for lack of a better term. So um, um, just comments on the scale, and um, um, I guess I'll leave it at that, the, the structure and the scale. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. Yes, uh, so the program is is operated by the White Bird Clinic. Um, as I said before, they uh, they started out in 1969 um, as a sort of countercultural clinic, and they've evolved into uh, a, a very large health clinic 
that provides services, um, medical, dental, counseling, behavioral health, crisis assistance on the streets, crisis assistance in, um, in a crisis clinic, 24-hour phone line, um, did I say dental, they, they, all of this stuff. It's a huge, huge organization um, that, that uh, mostly works with uh, people who have low or no income. Although with CAHOOTS, uh, we work with obviously anyone. So sometimes we'll be working with people on the street. Sometimes we'll be working with them in their, you know, 7,000 square foot homes. Um, we, we work with anyone. Uh, and then the city of Eugene pays for the CAHOOTS services in the city of Eugene. Um, so they fund that through the police department. So um, they give the money to the police. The police give the money to us. Um, some of that stuff is owned by us, so the hiring and the benefits and all that kind of stuff is, is owned and run by Whitebird Clinic. Um, the vans are maintained and fueled by the city um, and owned by the city. And then in the city of Springfield, we are funded mostly by the county of Lane County, partly by the city of Springfield, and then we've also recently picked up a little bit of money from the local Medicaid CCO. Um, so the local Medicaid CCO uh, uh, realized that we were saving them a ton of money <laughs> because we are doing wound care and all that kind of stuff for people out on the street rather than doing it in the emergency room. And so they said, hey, we'd like to pay you some money to make sure that you're doing that really well. And so they started paying us some funds too. So then um, of those two cities, uh, we have a 24-hour van in Springfield, and we have a 24-hour van and a 12-hour overlap van in Eugene. And we run, oh, what is it now? We have, we have right around, it's right around 30 to 31, I think, um, full-time employees, um, FTE, but we, I, we, I think we employ more like 40 people. Thank you. It just occurred to me there was a difference in scale. For instance, uh, Eugene is about three times bigger than Santa Cruz. And also, as you described here, there's multi-jurisdictional support for this contract. Yeah. A third party. Anyway, you don't, don't need to go into more detail, but that was okay. kind of the impression I got. Yeah. All right. Um, are there any other questions from council members? Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you. I actually um, would like to hear a little bit more about your funding um, because I think it's, um, you know, it's important to understand, like, where the money is being saved. Is that, um, is that being redirected or is it, are you getting funding from additional funding sources, probably a combination? Um, I'd love to hear just a little more about that. Well, yeah, those four funding sources are all of our funding. So City of Eugene, Medicaid CCO, County, and City of Springfield. Um, the City of Springfield, like I said earlier, is, is identical in size to the City of Santa Cruz, um, both population and, and um, area. Uh, so we... In terms of funding, Eugene is a cheaper place to live than Santa Cruz, so thinking about some place like um, here, it would need to be more expensive. It would just cost more, um, just because uh, folks would need to, you know, be paid a little bit more. Um, and uh, and then we also we also we get, we garner a, a certain amount of donations every year. Um, you know, I, I think I, it's it, it just varies from year to year. It's often you know. A, Fifty thousand to a hundred thousand um, dollars. We're a very well regarded program. People really like us. We win. The, we always win like some award every year, you know, or whatever. Um, and and so we, use, we usually use all that donation money to do things like buy blankets, buy sleeping bags, buy tents, and that kind of stuff. Tarps and and those kinds of things as well. So um, donation money often covers a lot of the sort of. Um, resources that we hand out. Okay. Uh, Council Member Golder. Sorry, I had to figure out how to unmute. Um, I want to say thank you for the presentation. I first heard about this model, uh, I think it was 2013, when I was on a public safety task force for the city, and I really have found it fascinating. And since then, I've visited Eugene a couple of times, and I've just felt like it's 
um, safe and welcoming and like a great place. So I, I, I appreciate all the work that everyone's doing up there as well. And I just have a question um, about the tr level of training for the individuals, and I'm sure it varies. I know you mentioned you got your EMT, but um, typically, like, what's your entry, you know, I don't know, entry level, and then, you know, how long do the employees stay with you usually, and is there a high tur turnover rate, or is this kind of a career or a stepping stone, and can you just speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, to be a crisis counselor with us, you have to have two years of what we call a mental health experience in a, or experience in a non-traditional mental health setting. So typically this is something like a group home, a shelter, a drop-in center, but mostly it's environments where people have a tendency to become easily escalated or there can be a lot of conflict and the person has to show that they're skilled at maintaining peace and and sort of order by by um, interacting with people in a positive and welcoming way to, to, to do that and um, so people who are, who are skilled at doing that so what I also tell people sometimes is that we really like people who have been bartenders baristas People like that that um, that really need to be good at, at at making you feel positive, you know, making you feel good. Somebody who can talk to you and m immediately make you feel like you're their best friend, because that's a lot of what crisis work is. It's going into somebody's home in their life where they're the most vulnerable, they're the most overwhelmed. They may be in the worst moment of their life, and they need you to be able to come in and speak with them and make them feel positive right away and connect with you very quickly. So somebody who can do that, that's what we're looking for. Um, obviously, with the EMT on the medic side, uh, we require them to have um, a licensure that's either an EMT basic, an advanced EMT, a paramedic, or an RN licensure. Um, so any one of those four licensures can, can work with us. And then we kind of also need them to, um, to have some, some of that similar crisis counselor skills, you know, people that are, that are good at doing uh, medical evals on somebody who might be suicidal and things like that. It's very difficult, so they've got to be skilled at that kind of stuff, too. Um, we train them. Um, we train them for a long time. Um, they need to, and, and, and it's difficult because they need to show that they know how to do pretty much everything. They need to show us that they know how to do a suicide assessment. They need to show us they know how to do a family mediation. They need to show us they know how to do, you know, talking with people who are experiencing mania, people are hearing voices, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, because we can't control what kind of calls they're going to get on on any given shift. Uh, while they're training, then the, the training can last rather long. Um, additionally, we do about 20 hours of sort of classroom work with them before they get on the vans, before they get working, um, and that's really to introduce them to a lot of the concepts that um, that, that they need to know and, and, and just kind of get up to speed on some of the stuff that they might not be so skilled at. Some people come to us with a lot of experience, like um, the, one of the women who's the current um, director of the program, she came to us with a ton of crisis experience. It was just amazing. We barely had to train her at all. Some people, like myself, who had worked in drop-in centers and stuff like that, but was kind of doofusy on the suicide assessments, um, you know, I had to learn how to, you know, they had to really get me up to speed and skilled on those types of things. So um, it just sort of depends um, on, on how long it's going to take people. Does that, does that answer all your questions? Yeah, it does. How long do people usually stay? I mean, do people see oh, it as yes. a career or like a stepping stone to... Um, it, I think if it paid better, more people would see it as a career, um, but uh, we can have long, it, everyone wants their job to pay better. So, um, you know, uh, some people stay for a very long time. So my friend Robert has been on the team since 2004. Um, he's been around over half the life of the program. And then some folks, especially some of the EMTs, it's really great for them to come in, work there for two years, and get their hours so that they can apply to um, physician's assistant school or medical school or things like that. So sometimes it works really well as a leaping off point for people to go on to further study. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. No, I was, I, yeah, thank you. But anyone who works on Cahoots is like a Cahoots junkie. We're all obsessed with it. Um, I mean, I, I'm obsessed with it. I would, I would go, I love it. I'd go back right away. Okay. All right, Councilmember Byers. Um, maybe. 
talk back to the funding. Maybe you um, covered this, but it seems to me you did say how the amount of um, trips to the ER you've saved. Do you get money through Medicare that way, or are the hospitals? I'm just familiar with a nonprofit program that has four beds when they get released from the hospital, rather go back out mm -hmm. in the street. You know, we give them a bed till they're up and about. And that really helps fund, you know, this nonprofit. Um, yeah, so we don't we don't do any billing. Um, so and even when our money comes from Medicaid, we don't bill them for that. They just kind of give us a lump sum um, for for I, and I can't remember what the number is, but they okay. they just recognize that that look we're saving them a grip of money, um, okay. you know, and and so then they just pay us out that much. Um, and then you know, there's been there's been a back and forth about whether we should try to bill. Um, but crisis services are very difficult to bill for. A lot of times, um, you know, health insurance companies don't want to pay for it. Um, they'll figure out any way they can not to. So then it just becomes too much of a burden to figure out how to sort of like chase down all these bills and stuff like that. So we've just stayed away from that. Okay, Councilmember Brown. Thanks. I, I thought of one more question, which probably doesn't have any definitive answer, but um, actually really just to get your thoughts. So, um, and it was helpful because I know about the program. I've been to a couple of your uh, presentations and other venues, so um, I'm really glad that you're here today. Thank you. Um, uh, but I, what I hadn't thought about was um, the kind of timing and development of your program. So, you know, so having started, having Whitebird kind of be established and doing this kind of activity um, is, and then kind of, and then integrating into a system that was newly developing is really different than our situation where we have, I mean, and not just an existing system, but an existing system that is like, like really complex, pretty convoluted with these siloed funding streams and qualifications and eligibility and all of that and um, and so it's it's just it, it's really overwhelming to think about how to try to map something like this onto an existing system that's just as kind of challenging challenged and challenging as it is um, so I'm wondering if you have any um, thoughts on you know how we move forward you know advice, uh, and this is just kind of the elevator version. I'd love. I hope that uh, we can continue to work with y'all uh, moving forward uh, more direct. But just for now, what your thoughts are? Yeah, certainly. So we do. I mean, is the my, I guess you're asking me maybe a little bit for my sales pitch. Um, we at Coops we do offer uh, consulting services to cities who are interested in this kind of stuff. Um, that that. That involves uh, a few steps of things, um, one of which is to look at all your police and fire data and sort of give a good sense about, okay, what of these calls could we, could a mobile crisis team potentially handle? Um, and then also, you know, looking at uh, your, your area and doing sort of a resource map and saying, okay, who, who would probably be most interested in calling a program like this? Um, what, where could the team transport people to? Is it feasible to have them transporting to here or there or there? Um, what's already existing? So, you know, something like the mental health liaisons, how would um, a, a mobile crisis intervention team like Cahoots fit into that? You know, um, a lot of cities that have co-response have really talked about the idea of maybe creating what is essentially a tiered system. So you have kind of like the 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 Cahoots style team is is um, you know the the first responders, and then if if there needs to be a hold, if they feel like there needs to be a hold, then they then they get the co-response team involved and um, things like that. Um, similarly, um, so we would we would look at that kind of stuff and then um, help identify maybe a local nonprofit that could run the program and help write their RFP for that. Uh, and then ultimately, since I live in California and I you know have a good relationship with um, my sister-in-law, um, then we could, I could, I, we would come up and um, actually train the folks and and help get that whole thing going and off the ground. Um, we 
we do have a lot of experience doing that. We did that in Denver. We did that in Olympia. Um, but also we did it sort of in Springfield as well. Um, there's a lot of things that we learned from that experience expanding into Springfield. Um, and so I think there's a lot of lessons that we would be happy to impart um, upon whoever ends up doing this kind of thing if you guys are interested in creating something like that. Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and I think, you know, honestly, uh, Councilman Brown asked the question I really had in mind, which is sort of, we can't, um, we can't create the same history that you evolved in in your region, but where can we start from with what we have here in Santa Cruz now, and so I appreciated your response to that. One of the things that you did mention was that um, you uh, sort of build capacity based on sort of a gap in needs assessment, but also a partnership with a nonprofit, and so my question is, I think, is a nonprofit essential to how this model works in various regions, or have you seen any other forms of structure? Well, I uh, and there's some there's some disagreement between me and other people at Whitebird about this. So uh, this is uh, maybe my opinion, not the opinion of Whitebird Clinic. Um, I think that it can work just fine not doing it through a nonprofit. Um, I think it can also work really well through a nonprofit. And there's positives and minuses to both. So um, the Portland version of it is not going to be through a nonprofit. It's going to be funneled through the fire department. Um, similarly with the um, San Francisco version, although the San Francisco version is going to be kind of beefed up, and um, I think it's, I think they're they're having too many employees on each um, on each team. They're but they're, they're going to use three people instead of two, which I think is too much. Um, and it's going to cost them a lot, and it's going to be really hard to staff it. Um, so, you know, so they're also going to run it through the fire department, um, but then cities like Denver, they're doing it through a nonprofit, and also I think something like the city where, like, the crisis worker is um, funded through the county or something like that, EMT is funded through, like, a hospital. Um, so there's other ways to do it like that, too. Um, and I know other cities have kind of considered doing a similar thing. Um, and then there's just, and then, like, Olympia, they just do straight nonprofit. So, you know, it's, there's, there's different ways to do it and think about it and think about what might work best for your city in your area. And sorry, I also have one other. Thank you. So it sounds like it just sort of is um, based on the various cities. And then my other question is in terms of reimbursement. You mentioned that um, you know your program doesn't do the doesn't kind of go through the, the process of reimbursement. But are other programs in other cities are they using that model? Because it seems to me that that although you're gifted the dollars, it seems to me that often you need to have some sort of form of reimbursement for the for the Medicare Medicaid dollars. No, no one's billing. I don't think any any other programs are doing billing. It's like I said, it's just really difficult to bill for crisis services. So, and and, and I should say too, you know, one of the things that we get around is that we're able to do transports to hospitals um, and urgent cares and things like that. We're not mandated to transport to the emergency room the way the ambulances are, um, precisely because we're not an ambulance. Um, and sort of what what makes something an ambulance is that you are going to give drugs and route, right? You like have somebody on a gurney and you're going to give them some kind of medication. So we don't do that at all. So we'll give you Narcan if you're lying on the street, but as soon as you get in the van and we're driving, we don't Narcan you, you know, and that, that keeps us from getting that ambulance designation, which makes us more flexible around where we can transport to. Um, because we have that flexibility, that also means that we can't do things like bill for uh, a medical transport or bill for um, something you know of that nature. Um, so we, we try to avoid billing it at all costs. Um, because it just allows us to be more flexible. And then the Medicaid money that we get is, um, like I said, it's just a lump sum. Um, they just recognize that we're saving them money, so they start to pay us a little bit. I have, I'm sorry, I have one last question. In, okay. in, terms, um, in terms of legal liability with, like, you know, health and, and willingness, is there, is that a, a, a kind of a concern, or how has that been worked out in this model? Yeah, I mean, we've never been sued before um, because we got a lot. We have a lot of things that sort of like keep us um, safe on that kind of stuff. A lot of uh, 
you know, uh, policies and things like that to keep us from that happening. Um, one of which is that, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, if somebody wants to get out, then we let them out. You know, we don't, we don't like crap people. Um, similarly, we pay for our own malpractice insurance. The EMTs, EMTs have to pay, have to work under a medical license of a doctor. So we have a medical director who's the, the medical director for the program. He's an emergency room doctor. He provides and he provides us with, um, you know, sort of oversight and, and gives us a lot of uh, sort of direction on what we can and cannot do. So we have that as well put in place um, to sort of keep us uh, our liability low. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Myers and Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to thank you, Ben, for your presentation. Um, really interesting work that you guys are doing and um, just a, a great history to learn about. Um, I'm just curious, uh, a couple quick questions, and most of my questions have been asked by other council members, so I won't, I won't take too long. Um, I'm curious about, I'm just curious about how, how, you know, the assistance and the treatment and um, sort of all the efforts, whether or not there's an integrated system at all with, for example, so, you know, here, in, I'm sure you're, I, I think I saw you online all day today, so with us, so, you yeah, know, we have listening. this, obviously, this um, system of care between our behavioral health and, um, fire fire police response um i'm just curious about how your data or how, i'm just curious about that integration with either other public safety um entities or into the county mental health behavioral health um homeless um homeless kinds of structures are are, are you guys feeding information back in or how to how do you how do you integrate so in other words you're doing all this work on the street, but you know you're part of a system where you're we're basically hopefully trying to serve people and get them you know into a more stable situation initially, but then hopefully, as we've heard many times today, into you know into stabilizing themselves in their in, with their lives and you know their their uh, health and other things. Do you guys integrate back into kind of the larger system of care continuing? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So um, the metaphor that I like to use is that we at Cahoots really view ourselves as the spokes on a wheel. Mm -hmm. So if the if the patient is the hub and the services available to them are the wheel that that can sort of move them forward, Cahoots views ourselves very much as the spokes. Um, we're there to connect that patient to those services, um, and we're also there to support those services when they need us. Um, to provide crisis intervention or something else. So um, there's a lot of things going on in Eugene. There's um, homeless outreach teams, there's permanent supportive housing, there's crisis center, there's a sobering center, um, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, what's called the, the high risk team or the HRT that that looks at, okay, who are the sort of top 20 utilizers of the emergency room and services and are living on the street and how can we get them into housing so that they aren't using those services so much. We're a part of that team. Um, we're, we're in a lot of meetings with all of those services. We, um, you know, we're, we, our administrators end up just having meetings constantly with all of these types of areas, so crisis, sobering. Um, you know, homeless shelters, everything, because we're connected into all of them. We're sort of, we're like I said, we're sort of the spokes to all of them. Um, and and one of the great things about our service is that not only are we making referrals to those types of services, but when we make that referral to that service, if it's within business hours and it's during the day, we can just take you to it. You know, um, it's it's not a like, oh, here, you should go here and um, and please do that tomorrow. It's like, uh, yeah, here, you want to go 
to talk to the people over there about getting into treatment, cool, we'll drive you down there, you know, and we get in the van, we drive them down there and they can do a talk, you know, um, you call them up, hey, you you free to do an intake for this person for, for uh, mental health services? Yes, all right, we'll be there in 15 minutes, you know. Um, so that's a really great part of our program. Um, and similarly, if I go out on, on a call at 2 a.m. and the person says, you know, I really want to get into this program, but I don't know how, and we're like, oh, that's cool, we'll help you. Um, I can just put in a call for that person at 9 a.m. the next day, uh, and uh, one of our vans will go out and take them over there uh, when when it, that, that call comes up. So, yeah, we're very integrated into that whole system, um, and I think that – uh, that system really relies on us. Um, and s similarly, um, you know, case managers and people who do permanent supportive housing, they work really difficult jobs um, that, that also end up with them responding to their clients on weekends and after hours and all that kind of stuff. And so with Cahoots, it um, really frees up people who do that kind of work to just call us up and say, hey, can you please just go check on my on my client who's suicidal or why not so, so I can just have my Saturday. Um, and, and so we do a lot of that support as well. Uh, that's, yeah, that, actually that was my next question was I was, you know, so much of, of well, there's a number of, you know, number of different kind of situations but but yeah that sort of that integration was specifically on the case managers so it sounds like you guys um are you know you're part of that system and um i mean do you have a sense in eugene um since you work there and you guys have been working there so long i mean do you have a sense that how many case managers are part of that system through various nonprofits or county government or I'm not quite sure how it all falls together up there in Oregon? Yeah, well, it's a lot of, uh, let's see. In Permanent, well, permanent supportive house in permanent supportive housing and just homeless uh, case management. There's um, there's three really big programs. There's a place called Shelter Care, place the Catholic Community Services, which is in a lot of areas, and then White Bird as well. Okay. Um, and there's probably uh, between those three organizations. Well, Celtic is by far the largest. They probably have like 50. I mean, it's a very large organization. Um, Catholic Community Services is probably smaller, probably more like 20 or 25, and then Whitebird has like four um, case managers. So, you know, it's, it's it's probably in the realm of like 70 to 80 case managers working on that kind of stuff um, at any given time. Cool. Well, I really appreciate um, and all your work that you guys are doing. It's super inspiring and um I, I was reading all the materials and looked at, through everything and went on and read a bunch more, and so very inspiring work. So thank you very much for the presentation. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. Right, Councilmember Matthews. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just say um, I did talk with um, people at the county to get uh, there um, to, and, and with our police chief as well. Um, Following on the discussions that we've had just recently, the, the study session of, from um, on the Focus Strategies report has to do with homelessness, which I understand is not entirely the unique um, service <laughs> cluster that that you're talking talked about, but certainly related to in yeah. large extent. Um, and we did have at our previous study session, a very long, long presentation on a major rethinking of the county's organization of uh, homeless services, which was um, a lot of the focus was on better coordination um, among county departments and other other partners in this. Um, and I did just confirm with uh, the police chief, and I had heard from the people at the county as well, that they're, they're there are active conversations now aiming exactly towards this goal. So um, that's very encouraging. <laughs> um, and we seem to have gotten a lot of good background study. Again, it's not exactly um, comparable, but it, it's uh, very much related. Um, and I guess it's a question to the mayor. Are you looking for a motion here to accept these reports? Um, I would be happy to propose something along that line um, if you are. My thought would be to accept the three reports um, 
and uh, at some point in the coming, early in the coming year, request an update on the um, discussions between the city and the county, the various divisions of the county, um, um, for reorganization and improving uh, service delivery, um, and also to encourage continued communication with the Hoot. Um, I think they have a lot to offer. It's different, but certainly there. Um, um, yeah, I think. Relationship with continuing. Yeah, absolutely. So that, and that would be my motion. The one issue is that we still haven't opened it up for public comment. So. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I'm happy to to uh, return to that once we've gone to public to comment. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. No problem. Um, then I had a couple questions. Um, one is, you know, understanding you mentioned that you all offer con consultation services with cities that are interested in these kinds of models. What's the cost for that generally? Like, does it depend yeah, it's, um, it's, it's based on, you know, it's based on the size of the city and so on. So we'd have to put together a bid for you. Um, yeah, but, and, I'd, you know, you, you're free to request that and I'd be happy to provide that. Okay, and then how long um, would you estimate it takes for these kinds of programs to be stood up? Well, and then, again, um, I know that depends on the size of the city as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we usually, uh, we like to, um, we like to try to get it done from start to finish in nine months. Um, to, to have sort of your vans on the ground trained up by us um, in nine months. Um, and and uh, that really depends, that really obviously depends largely on, on sort of political will and funding and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if, if you sort of like get it figured out, all right, we're gonna, you make a determination, we're gonna do something like this and you hire us, then we're gonna, we're gonna get you, you're gonna get you to having a Kahoot style van on the ground. Whether that's 12 hours a day, 24 hours a day, 18 hours a day, whatever, you know, five days a week, seven days a week, not, it's not clear, but we try to have that, you know, going within, within nine months. Great, thanks. Um, Council Member Golder. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of other partners, I don't know if we've talked about that we might want to consider including would be obviously like Dignity, Pamps, Kaiser, um, any of the other health organizations that I'm not thinking of, and then obviously AMR, I'm sure they they transport a large number of people, and I know from when my husband used to work on the ambulance how expensive that, that little taxi ride is for some people, or not taxi ride, you know what I mean, like a ride, and sometimes it's not necessarily what's needed. So I don't know if there's funding that could be diverted away from that towards something like this. Or who pays for that? I don't even know. Well, so. And and I've I've never talked with AMR about this, but I I have a, some suspicion that they might be kind of interested in hearing more about something like this because they're an organization that because of their responsibilities of you know transporting people, having um you know they're requesting to go to the hospital. Um, so many of those don't end up being reimbursed from uh, oh, yeah. Medi-Cal yeah. or Medicare that could easily go to a Kahoot style program for especially for what's an, essentially a non-emergency transport. Um, you know, so that that they that bogs them down, and it, it ends up sort of like preventing them from getting to actual emergencies quicker. So, um, yeah, definitely would I, I, I think they might be in there. Yeah, you re re read my mind. That's exactly what I was thinking because I know they have a lot of unreimbursed expenses when they take people. Just because if you call them and you ask for a ride, you get that ride. They have yeah. to. Yeah. So I felt like they would be a partner. no further questions or comments from city council members, I'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. So if there are members of the public who want to comment on the item before us, which is the presentation um, about the CAHOOTS program, now is the time to call in using the numbers that are provided for you. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Once you've been un asked to unmute yourself, you'll be given two minutes. Talking to me? Yes. Okay. My name is Gray. 
G R E Y. Um, I uh, volunteer a lot out here in Santa Cruz County. One of the places I do volunteer is at uh, Food Not Bombs. I didn't get on earlier. I, I mean, I got on the phone line, but I, I wasn't called on. So, things that you're talking about just at the last um, information, um, it kind of relates to that. I was wondering if anybody, I didn't hear this, if anybody on any of these committees, including the one that just uh, gave out the information, one, I was interested in knowing if any of them are homeless or really are close to somebody that's homeless. And the other thing is, I wanted to comment, maybe it be a question too. Personally, I've been um, with the police, or actually sheriff, and I wouldn't want this to happen in in our city of Santa Cruz, but um, at gunpoint uh, and asked to give ID, and that was at nighttime. So I'm afraid, and I hope that this will alleviate um, the problem of having people uh, profiled, whether they look like a certain religion or a certain race, certain gender, or even a certain status looking like a homeless person, because there's a lot of harassment out there, and I've been, I guess I looked like a homeless person, or my vehicle did, so hopefully that will uh, cure it. But, uh, so I'm, I'm interested in knowing if you think that would uh, alleviate those problems, and if anybody uh, on your committee or in your group is homeless. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is, that, is that a question? I'm not sure if that's a question for me or not. I think that's for, I'm not really clear on the questions, but I think what we're going to do is we'll have people comment, and then after the comments are, have been made, we'll circle back to any relevant questions. Okay. Okay, so the next caller, if you can press star six, that'll unmute your microphone, and you'll be given two minutes to speak. Please press star six to unmute your device. What we'll do is we'll come back. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Hey, Reggie, um, Reggie here. So I love this program. I wanna see this program. Um, and I wanna see it uh, really taken seriously and looked at. You know, I think what the county was working on was nice, but you know, it's clearly not meeting the same scope and demand that could do this meeting. Uh, it's not diverting calls, which as I said earlier today, there are like half of calls are about check or suspicious activity. I mean, this is not uh, appropriate. This is not an appropriate use of resources, and it's not appropriate for people who have mental health crises who are being called on. Um, and I know, you know, um, Council Member Matthews is visibly, um, you know, uncomfortable during this meeting. <laughs> she doesn't want this to happen. She wants to push it out to uh, early this year because then it'll be a new council and a new mayor who is um, possibly not as interested in a program like this. But Santa Cruz is a great place for this program. We have tons of uh, free activist driven um, uh, like food and uh, other assistance programs that could work in tandem with this. Warming center, day night storage, food not bombs, DSA, Santa Cruz deployed. There's tons of just basically free coordinated resources and labor here. And uh, and the community really wants this. And so I would like to meet 
before next year, before we have a total council member shakeup, and uh, really get moving on this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try the next speaker again. Novak, uh, you've been unmuted. Get the last four digits of your phone number are nine seven nine seven. You're on the line. Oh, hi, this is. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, this is Sheila Carrillo, and I am speaking from two different directions here. Uh, the first is I'm an activist community member who's part of the DSA Alternative Emergency Response Working Group. And I've also had a personal experience of, of, of a, a 5150 on a, a young person. I wanted to share that as well. Um, I. I wanted to say I'm, I'm excited and thrilled to see that. Okay, this Hello? Hello? We're, we're still here. Looks like they hung up. So we'll move on to the next caller. So if you've called in, again, let's press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Um, and then when you've been asked to unmute, you'll need to press star six. And I would encourage you to turn down your streaming devices and listen and speak through your phone um, so that you're up to speed with where we're at in the meeting. Okay, if the last four digits are 7470, please unmute your device. Hi, um, my name is Josh Brahinsky. I live in town. I'm calling, um, it's probably a question for Ben, but also just sort of a comment, which is that it sounds like, like this is an interesting proposal. Uh, like the whole idea is something that it sounds like there would be tremendous support for in this community. It's really very different sounding than a lot of the other things that we disagree about. Um, but, but I think the idea that, that, that we could do something that saves money and that does better treatment for people and, um, and, and can work in a way that's pretty simple within the community that doesn't require a big complex mess is something to think about. So I think one of the things that I would ask for the city council to think about today is can you um, ask them formally for a you know proposed budget for the support that we could give to this um, work, uh, and I think the question I have for for all of you to think about is, and, and for Ben in particular, is there a way to do this, like to pilot this in a small? Uh, can, can is this the kind of thing you could pilot and test over like w w without too much? set up like could, could we say try it in some small number of calls in the city and see if it works um, and see what the problems are and also just sort of give ourselves a chance to get used to it and see what that's like um, have you done something like that before uh, is that possible Justin is that something that's possible here um, in our city that's the question okay thanks bye thank you
Okay, next caller is 7069. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Oh, hi. Hey, uh, my name is Faz. Um, I wanted to first of all um, thank the council. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for bringing this up to the agenda. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. Um, I, I've personally been a part of um, a few informational sessions with CAHOOTS in the past and just really inspired by the work that they're doing. Um, and I think especially in a city like Santa Cruz, I think we have a whole lot of precedent to um, do a CAHOOTS style program, um, given that the police chief himself has said that um, if we have the services and the resources for homelessness, then uh, please, please do it, basically. Uh, I'm paraphrasing that. but. I think we really have a really great opportunity to do that, and um, I'm, I'm really uh, just personally inspired by this. I'm glad that the council has taken up this conversation, um, and I'm just hoping that the council will consider moving forward with, um, you know, whether it be a pilot program or some form of program to uh, be a Kahoot style program. Um, but with that being said, I, I, I feel very strongly that it should be a program that is independent. Um, of the police department, um, and I feel like it, it is a potential for a really awesome and compassionate and empathetic solution to um, a lot of the issues that our community members face. So I'm really excited about the program, really appreciate the council um, hearing this and having the study session and really encourage the council to uh, move forward with this program. So thanks so much. is Serge Cagno again. Um, I, quick comments. Um, absolutely thank you for presenting uh, this evening and for the City Council to give time for this. Um, this was one of the intermediate uh, recommendations from our Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. Um, it seems like a possible way forward would be trying to figure out what the basic details of the program are and uh, sending out a um, LOI, a letter of interest to pro programs in the county that would like to apply for something um, and having them um, offer up budgets as they to provide services depending on what the details are. At the same time, starting to talk to the county about different ways of funding this kind of program. Um, just hoping that we can actually move forward on this sort of a amazing program uh, that does a lot of collaboration uh, to help people on the streets, but also to get people off the streets. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm Carol Williamson from the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Santa Cruz County. I'm calling to say thank you. This has been really interesting, and I think it's important to continue this discussion. It's so complex, like, um, like some of you have mentioned, figuring out how to interweave this with what exists already to enhance and expand the capacity through the whole county, not just the city, would be really great to look at how do we get some law enforcement um, response uh, eliminated from encounters where where, where it's um, overkill or not needed. And there's many, many cases where we have tremendous partnerships with law enforcement, and I appreciate them so much, but the opportunity to um, have an option like Cahoots is is um, exciting to me. Some so many calls are just someone who's suicidal, depressed, and need someone to talk to, not be further frightened. Um, so uh, the downtown outreach program um, that Encompass runs seems like sort of similar, but would need expansion with a lot more staff, uh, capability to cover more territory, and a van. And um, so there's just sort of a starting point in my mind of a, uh, what, what would be a frame of reference. Um, but I also hope that you create a study session that looks at capacity. It sounds like everyone doesn't 
have a handle on the numbers, the scarcity of the capacity for mental health housing of all levels. So um, thank you for your study and thank you for putting on the session and thank you, uh, Ben Clymer. You've been unmuted, and you have up to two minutes. So, Adam Novak, your microphone is unmuted. You have two minutes to speak. J.P. Doyle, if you could please press star six to unmute your mic, uh, you'll be given two minutes. and you'll be given two minutes. Hi, this is Sheila Carrillo again. I'm, uh, this is a really complex system for me. I just wanted to say that in the short time, our uh, alternative emergency response group has been working to educate ourselves and the community. There's been an incredible res community response in favor of instituting such a program. Um, and we have had a petition I'm on. Actually, I was just notified that you already had an opportunity to speak, and so unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask that um, we allow other members of the public to speak. Additionally, um, we're going to have to have a hard stop on public comment at 5 o'clock, so I want to thank everybody who's called in. But if you have further questions or comments, then um, you can email them to the city, and we will take that into account. Okay, so I've got about time for about two more people, and then we'll bring it back to council for any further action and discussion. Okay, so the last four digits are 3539. You're on the line. Yeah, real quick, uh, you said that you didn't, you wanted to give other people uh, um, a chance, but, uh, and also you said you were going to come back around to my question. So my question was to the person that just gave the last information and actually to. So, sir, if you, if you spoke already, um, then we'll we'll return to the questions that were asked earlier, but um, we're gonna allow you can only comment once during public comment. So, thank okay, you. okay, thank you. Okay, we're gonna have one more comment and then bring it back to council. Um, hello. Good evening. Hi. Uh, so I, I, I don't think you can get a better issue that is bipartisan. Um, both the fiscal conservatives and as well as the progressives can both agree on this um, issue that will save the county money, especially during this um, 
economically uncertain time. But in particular, I, I think that we should also focus on how this CAHOOTS program has helped maybe those who've experienced homeless to become mental health counselors themselves, maybe even um, become the EMTs to help service the very population that they once were a part of, because I know that Santa Cruz has a very successful program such as the streets teams, but I also think that the CAHOOTS model could provide an opportunity for our community to um, provide a job uh, for those who are here, who are being um, diverted to the services that are there for them, but are also having trouble sticking to a job that provides meaning. And oftentimes, you know, where you have come from, what circumstances you have overcome can provide you a passion in which to go into uh, helping those who you identify with. So I think that's something that should be put on the table, as well as um, I would like to, to say a quote, you know, a, a developed world isn't where the poor drive cars, but where the rich use public transportation. And I think I have heard of a CAHOOTS presentation before where one of the members actually went to a politician's kid who was having a mental health crisis and was able to service that. And I think that this system is able to service people uh, of wide demographics and wide socioeconomic background, but also can maybe um, employ those of the same type. And I think especially in a community in which um, mental health is very foreign and we don't have an integration and in where um, average people can learn about mental health, this can really provide an opportunity for us to learn more about it so as citizens we can be more aware and, and do much better for our community and, and for the world. So. Thank you, and I uh, appreciate this time. All right, thank you very much. Um, with that, we're going to close public comment. I think there were a few questions that were asked early on in the discussion. I was tr trying to keep track of most of them. So um, I think there was one that was asked around, um, it, it wasn't really clear, but they were asking around the, whether they were homeless people who were working with committees. And just to that, there's there's currently no committee that's kind of working on this. This was just a study session brought forward about programs that were run by the city, the county, and then a presentation on the CAHOOTS model program. Um, you know, we've had a number of committees throughout the year where homeless people have been on in, in those discussions and have provided and contributed to discussions around how the city responds to homelessness, but um, I, I guess for the discussions today, I don't think that, that was a relevant question. Um, I did want to return to um, to one of the questions that was asked around potentially piloting this similar, this kind of program in the city, and I don't know if whether that would be appropriate for either the police chief, the fire chief, or a city manager if you're on the call. But um, you know, what potential could there could be to pilot something like this in the city? Hi, Mayor. This is uh, Andy Mills. I'm online, and um, we have had preliminary discussions uh, with the fire chief and myself to um, kind of knock heads and find out what it might look like uh, if we were to uh, pilot a project like this, whether it is a one with just paramedics and a person such as a mental health liaison or more of a CAHOOTS model, which is obviously a little bit different. It was a fantastic explanation of what they uh, have done. And uh, so that's as far as we've gotten. Uh, we have not put any structure behind it, but just the commitment to work together to see what that might look like in the future. Thanks. So that's, I think those are the main questions that came up during those discussions um, that we needed to address. And so thank you, Fire Chief, and thank you, Chief Mills, um, for being on the call and for helping to answer that community question. Uh, Council Member Brown. So, well, I was gonna just um, ask that uh, we try to get those questions answered, but I think that happened. Um, uh, you know, I and I understand um, Council Member Matthews is, wants to make a motion, um, but so I'll just make a couple of comments here. Um, you know, I, I believe that this, um, the model that's been described to us, um, the level in the community, and you know, kind of beyond, aside from the, um, uh, how to say this, um, 
Well, the interest in the community, the, um, the wonderful presentation we've received about how this model, this kind of model can work um, and the potential savings um, to be achieved, of course, that would happen over time, um, you know, as well as just having, you know, moving towards a more compassionate and effective responses to mental health crises and other crises. Um, you know, I don't, I think we must really, really seriously consider pursuing this kind of model. And I think that um, we have somebody here who is an expert in this, who is advising um, cities, you know, a lot greater population, a lot greater, you know, challenges or different kinds of challenges. And I think that we we really are taking this seriously and, and take um, uh, Mr. Clymer, Ben Adam, up on the um, offer to provide us with some information about what it would cost, you know, uh, a proposal. Um, so I, I really think that that's a, a serious, um, serious thing for us to consider. And I, I um, you know, I'm just going to be honest here and say I'm not really interested in hearing all of the reasons why we can't afford it and it's going to interfere with our work plan um, that's been adopted. Um, this is something that um, would not, you know, divert other staff from, uh, you know, working on the other issues. It would um, be an opportunity to have more of a dialogue with partners in the community, and um, and I think that could happen at, you know, the city manager's office level. Um, and given that the police chief has already said that this is something that he's made a commitment to at least converse about, um, that now is, a, is really a good time to be considering that. So I'm just going to say that for now. Um, I will, um, you know, be trying to offer up, uh, you know, some kind of uh, direction related to that after we hear uh, from uh, Councilmember Matthews. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Matthews. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure that our direction is all that different, frankly. Um, this was a, a really um, a very interesting presentation and the background material that you provided ahead of time. Um, I think we hear from our own public safety staff an openness to explore this, uh, an interest in exploring it. Um, my own feeling is that for um, a meaningful scale, it should involve the county. That's open for discussion, but that's certainly something we've heard about uh, the CAHOOTS model is a sense of scale, and that, that gets back to the cost and capacity. Um, it's clear that we have a lot of really good community resources here um, and that there's active interest in real time in improving the coordination, um, quality of service, and cost of, of the kind of emergency response and crisis intervention that we get. So there's a community desire to do that. Um, we have actually contacted with other groups outside the county for various programs. We contract with downtown streets, with block by block, et cetera. So um, this is definitely an option. Um, as also has been mentioned by the earlier uh, presentation, um, and even Mr. Hoot, an obstacle for us is capacity. And, and that's another whole issue we have to work on. So the motion that I would prepare would be the following. Um, to accept the three reports delivered today from SCPD and Encompass, from, community mental, from County Mental Health and Cahoots, to request a report back to Council in early 2021 regarding the conversations currently underway between city and county for reorganizing and improvement, improving local emergency and crisis response, engage additional community partners in the discussion of improving coordination, service, and cost, and continue the conversation with the who for consulting on further options, including involvement of the county. I'll, I'll second the motion, because I think that's, for where we're at, I think that seems like some appropriate next steps. Uh, Council Member Byers, and then I look, it seemed like Council Member Watkins, you might have raised your hand too. So but we'll go with Council Member Byers. trying to unmute. Um, this to me is one of the most exciting possibilities. We've been dealing with homeless, well I have since 1988, 
and there's, there's nothing been new. I mean, we don't have anything new. We keep doing the same thing. And here's a chance. I, I agree with the motion. I'm not, not absolutely all the four points of the motion. But I think the city of Santa Cruz receives all the homeless. The county is very important, but I would hate to see it bogged down because we can't serve the whole county, but absolutely they have to be a partner. But I would hope as you go forward um, next year uh, and look at this carefully and just just think in terms of why don't we try something that just hasn't been tried. Great, that's all, thanks. Thank you. Um, Council Member Watkins, did you raise your hand in your video? Yeah, sorry. No, my, I wanted to see if maybe we could get the motion back on the screen. I apologize. Something popped up on my screen and I couldn't see it, so I was um, blocked out from being able to see the full motion. Um, but as, as maybe we do that, I can just maybe share my appreciation for the presentation. I think we do really have a great opportunity to revisit how we've done things and to think about doing things differently and also really base it on the results we want to see and hopefully good humane outcomes for um, individuals who are experiencing crises in our community. Um, so thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure I fully understood what was part of this motion. Yeah, no, this, this sounds really great. Okay, I don't have any further questions. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Brown. I agree, I appreciate the, um, the motion. I completely agree with all of it and I will support it. I am going to make a motion now to amend this main motion to direct the city manager or uh, designate to explore a uh, request for a bid from um, Ben Annam Clymer and Cahoots for uh, consulting services uh, to establish uh, an um, MCIS, is that what it is? Mobile Crisis Intervention uh, Service Program in the city of Santa Cruz. And to communicate with the county our interest in coordinating this effort with them. Um, as the maker of the motion, um, I'm happy to accept the second part of that. I think uh, asking for a bid right now is premature. We don't know what services we're asking for. Um, so, I'm, as I say, I'm happy to communicate with the county our interest in coordinating the effort with them. Uh, that's a friendly amendment. Uh, I'm not interested in accepting the first one. So I, I had a feeling that was going to be the case, so I'm just okay. offering as an amendment motion, um, and we'll see if I get a second on that. Okay, so I was confused with, um, so the second part of this. I was trying to second the motion, Justin. Yeah, I, I was, oh no, I was Justin. just trying to see if, with what's on oh. the screen to just make sure oh. that it's clear. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, go ahead. I will second the motion. But uh, I'd also like to add, uh, to me, I, I think what the motion says to me is we want to move forward and explore this program and all the components of it, which I think to use the wheel as an example. Because everything I heard is what I see is so needed, uh, both better service and of course to save money. So I would hope what the motion is you know, let's not fool around. Let us invite them, uh, start the ball rolling in terms of looking at that program or how to apply it, when to apply it, and what are the steps. It's not going to happen overnight. I'm sure it's a quite a lengthy, uh, uh, it would be a lengthy process, but uh, I interpret this to move forward on Kahoot program. It seems perfect for the city, absolutely perfect. So if I could just ask for clarification, the motion to amend was to amend the main motion 
to add items one and two to the main mode, not not a substitute for it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Mayor, if I may, this is Kelsey. Sure. This is Mark. I wonder if, because um, I, I appreciate the direction that I think we all share in wanting to go, and so I wonder if one potential um, like compromise solution could be that after there's an engagement and conversation with some of the partners, that we get more clarity on what a potential um, bid or uh, you know scope of work could look like in terms of requesting uh, the Cahoots model to come and provide. Uh, con consultation to our city so that we're able to flesh out I think what some of the um, some of the further information of what the bid can include so I wonder if it just would be sequentially uh, you know appropriate to bring kind of the whole council along to say sure after we have these discussions with what our key partners are um, with including our key partners and then also identifying clarity of what the bid would look like that then the potential uh, for that uh, scope of work to come forward once that's been assessed, if, if you follow. I think I follow that, and I think part of it is, I mean, one of the steps, because one of the questions I have with the bid is that I think that that's assuming that there's a, I feel like there's a lot of steps, and I think that, you know, the first step it sounds like is that Cahoots could work with the city as a consultant to determine what would be most appropriate, right. and that seems right. like the first step. So right. before, Councilmember Brown. Precisely what I'm suggesting um, as a step. Oh. Okay. Make her out. Yeah. Okay. And then I also want to just let council members know that uh, we have a hard stop at 5.30, so we have 15 minutes. Um, and so I'm just asking if people can be brief with their comments. But I think that that, it seems like from what Councilmember Watkins was saying, you know, having those conversations with community partners and then coming, you know, figuring out what we can do together. And then, but I also hear what Councilmember Brown is saying that, you know, getting a, a bid or just an estimate how much these consulting services would cost would be good, especially when we go into our mid-year budget hearing. So we can have these that information before we we have that discussion. So Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Golder. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate the the thought on uh, or ways of engaging with the county to kind of inventory what they're doing and the changes that are being made. But I actually think that um, that is a conversation that we would more productively have if Cahoots was involved in that conversation because what I have found in my over 25 years now of watching um, how um, our local government um, structures um, respond to homelessness issues um, is we always say, yes, we want to explore this, we wanna move forward. Of course, it sounds like a no-brainer and then nothing changes. So if we don't have concrete steps to move forward, um, I, I fear that it'll just be, you know, a six, six months from now, another report on progress that the county's made um, from their focus strategies consultant, which is great. All of that work is great, but that is not what we're talking about here. So I'm gonna leave that amendment on the table as it's written. Um, I, I think that, that it's, it's if we are serious about this, we need to make a commitment to get the, the support, the expertise that we need to move forward appropriately. So I feel awkward interjecting after what Councilmember Brown just said, but um, item one to me is it's a little unclear as to what the direction is. And I'm wondering if it might be clearer to uh, direct the city manager or designee to request a proposal for consulting services. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I yeah. thought make it more palatable for folks, but you're, you're right. It's, clarity is important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Council Member Golder. Um, my question was for Ben, and I'm wondering typically what kind of information does he need before providing a bid? Like, w it sounds like we would need to do some background work before the bid, or or is that something you could throw out? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, 
I'm just a little confused about that. No, I, I don't need any more information to give you a bid because we, um, you know, we like I said, we kind of structure these based on size of cities. Um, so, you know, because obviously we're working with the city of uh, Los Angeles versus the city of Santa Cruz is going to be significantly different. So that's that's the main information that we need to know. So which we know. So um, we could get that to you probably within 24 or 48 hours. Okay. Um, I see the city manager has his hand raised, so just we can acknowledge him. Yes, thank you. Um, and I think this is alluded to. I just wanted to point out a couple of things also that um, are. You just muted yourself, Martin. Oops. I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, comment on some item you alluded to, and that is. Uh, uh, with respect to the process, one is that, of course, the other, the major issue that will have to be addressed too is funding, um, and, and the mayor uh, noted the mid-year uh, budget review, because um, as you know, we've got a, a major deficit that we'll be dealing with uh, next year, um, unless there's some kind of stimulus package, which we don't really know, uh, and probably won't know till uh, uh, probably next year sometime as, as to whether there'll be anything that will allow us to. Uh, not have to cut, um, right now we're looking at another $4 million that we have to cut from our budget next year uh, just to remain solvent. So uh, that is a big major issue, uh, by, you know, finding funding um, uh, in, in an environment where we're having to cut uh, significant uh, money to our general fund. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, uh, no, I think, I think, I think that's, oh, I'm sorry. And then the other component of this, of course, is that before you next uh, week will be the, the interim recovery plan. So that's the other thing you have to keep in mind in terms of the context of the work plan and how, how does this fall into priority. So just a reminder that we it will, that will be coming before you and you have to keep, keep in mind uh, how it all fits in with everything else that we're doing and, and how it fits in terms of priorities as well. So just a couple of comments there on, on two items. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Myers, then Councilmember Matthews, and Councilmember Watkins. And I would say, if we could keep our comments short, we do have a hard stop at 5:30. And also, I think if necessary, you know, it could be that we could separate the two motions. We can vote on, and we can both vote on on both of them separately if we're unable to find consensus. So with that, I'll turn it over to Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I'll keep my comments short. Um, I, I think that this model is is worth looking at, um, especially um, in terms of bringing them in to once once we've had some discussion with our own within our own system of care. Um, I think that you know we've been doing a lot of work with the county, and um, and actually. There's been a lot of work with our service providers. Um, COVID has really um, exponentially, you know, made the county and all the service providers um, really work towards, um, you know, creating systems, uh, much better communication. I, I just feel like, you know, asking for a bid right now without going and doing our due diligence with our partners it's just, it feels a little bit cart before the horse. So I understand the urgency. I understand the um, interest. Um, I think it's a interest, very, very interesting um, model we should look at, but I think um, I'm not gonna support issuing a, a request for proposals right now. Um, we have to go out to our partners, which we spent a couple of years trying to build a partnership and a good communication system with and uh, we need to go backwards and talk with them and and then we can bring this information forward uh, you know as appropriate during the, the budget scoping uh, mid-year so um, unfortunately I'm not going to support it because I think it's pushing us too far and having been on the two by two and worked through this whole year on COVID related and being in contact with folks almost every week I feel like we need to honor those um, coordination and communication structures we've been in place. So um, we've put in place over the last year. So those are my comments, thank you. If I could just really quickly interject, um, responding to the mayor's comment, it's the mayor's prerogative to define the question or it could be mm -hmm. done by motion as well. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Matthews.
I am willing to uh, modify that fourth item in my motion to say and direct city staff to continue conversation. Uh, I think it's more than the city manager's office. City attorney kind of alluded to this or designee. I mean, I think it's, it's our public safety staff. But if we said this and, and direct city staff to continue conversation with the group. Now, you would put that, mm, Bonnie, <laughs> go, up to, go up to my motion up there. Well, maybe that's not how you take your minutes. Well, you said number four, and there is no number four, so I just put it where Well, I meant, it, look, where you see my motion, it doesn't say one, two, three, four. Yeah. There's accept, request, oh, engage. Oh, this one right here? Yeah, so that one. So we just say, and direct city staff to continue conversation. I think the question here is whether the maker of the motion to amend would accept that as a friendly amendment and withdraw the motion to amend. Uh, well, you know, no, I'm happy to. No. I'm happy to see it in the main motion. I um, am not going to withdraw that that request. I think again, if we're serious, we need to do something rather than say we want to about thinking about it down the road. It's not getting typed the way I'm thinking it. Um, anyway, I will again reiterate, I believe this is responsive. I think it's premature to get into an RFP right now. The staff can have this discussion, bring it back. I'm just leave it there. I would like to divide the motion. Okay. And I, uh, I uh, Go ahead, sorry. I would like, in my original motion, I would like the fourth item to say, and direct city staff to, let's just add it right there, where it says and, insert. At the beginning, and, Bonnie. I think everyone understands what, yeah, take out most of that, really. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm using up time here. Should I just read it? That, that sentence then would read, and direct city staff to continue conversation with Kahoot for consulting on further options, including involvement of the county, period. Member Watkins. I am. Um, I. I think that there's a lot of agreement on on the council in regards to the direction, and I. I share the interest in wanting to get the. Direction. I don't think there's any, any cost with getting an, an RFP. I think um, you know it. It, it's, it will. It will be important information to understand what could be potentially offered to the city. I also recognize the interest in wanting to bring our partners along and wanting to have their their buy-in and potential shared ownership over what a future strategy could look like for our city and for our county. So I'm wondering if maybe a potential uh, compromise could be to have the two-by-two two create, uh, uh, explore the, um, the RFP, for uh, a county city uh, potential uh, consulting, you know, supportive service or whatever. And if that doesn't work out, then the city could at that time go their our own way potentially and have a separate RFP that would be just specific to the city. But I do think that from what I heard from our county presentation and our county has already really embraced this type of interest in having these diversion services that there is a real opportunity for us to co-create um you know a shared model and so how can we i think ultimately get to what i believe councilman brown and councilman matthews are expressing um in a way that's collaborative but um hopefully it's going to be more sustainable so just the potential alternative And so I don't know if it's a friendly 
a friendly amendment to the main motion or the um, the amendment that was proposed? I think it could be a friendly amendment to the main motion, and if the uh, from the maker of the friendly amendment and amended motion uh, felt comfortable with that, then I don't think we would need to have the amended motion. It could be the kind of the compromise bullet, if you will. Councilman Brown. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 fine with uh, moving in that direction if that's where the majority of the council wants to go. But I'm i I'd like to vote on the the amendment tonight. I think if we're serious, we need to again um, demonstrate that we're going to take some action. If it means, um, you know, we you know talk with cahoots and they can prepare a bid, and it seems like the, you know, and then two by two goes and talks to the county, and you know, the county expresses interest in going in this direction, then we can. Hey, we can address that when the time comes, but I'd like to vote on the the amendment and the or the amendment is a separate motion if that's the will of the mayor to divide them, and then we can vote on the or we can just vote separately. Okay. Before we take that vote, is because I think I, with the friendly amendment that I um, included be accepted by the maker and the seconder of the motion because that will help inform my vote for the amended motion. You know, actually, not for me. Um, I really think it's premature to go out for an RFP. What are you getting an RFP for? That's why I'm interested in continuing the conversation with the who's consulting for the options. They've mentioned that um, theirs is one model, and it's a good model, but there are similar programs that operate differently in different cities. We have, we have our own resources here, and we have a clear intention to improve them, but I would rather to have a little bit broader picture rather than saying, what's your bid to go do this service here in Santa Cruz? I think that's frankly jumping the gun. I think in involving our partners, looking at our resources is a, is a critical step when we look at what are the options open to us. So the council should vote on whether to accept the amendment to the motion first. And if that passes, then you can vote on the main motion with as amended. I was Tony. What Tony? What I was going to do was just separate the two motions. So the, yeah. the there'd be the main motion with the friendly amendments that were accepted, um, and then the motion that was made by Councilmember Brown. Yes, that was that, okay. okay. Can you um, confirm? Wasn't there only one friendly amendment accepted? Yes. So Councilmember Matthews accepted number two. Um, she did not accept the the number part one of that friendly amendment, at which to which point Councilmember Brown made a separate motion to amend. That's now been separated, so there's two motions on the floor, and then Councilmember Matthews did not accept the friendly amendment made by Councilmember Watkins. So why don't we go ahead and vote on the uh, main motion, and then we'll vote on the second motion, in that or since that's how they were proposed in that order. And so I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote on the first um, motion that was made. And that was made by Councilmember Watkins, or Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Mayor Cummings. So and don't we have to vote on the amendment to accept it first? We, the, the city attorney said that we could separate those as to two, two separate motions. So it's this one and then this one. So it's, um, Everything above the amendment is one motion. Okay. And then item number one of the amendment, those moved by Councilmember Brown, second by Councilmember Byers, that just that number one would be what we'd be voting on separately. So the friendly amendment language is off the table, Bonnie? Right. Right, but we still had the amendment, the first amendment. Right. But I mean, so now, it sounds like that's being made as a as a separate motion. Right, and and to, to adhere strictly to the rules, you would vote on the amendment first, and then vote on the main motion with or yes. without. So that's just what for clarification on the just for clarification on the minutes purposes, Councilmember Brown 
would have withdrew her amendment and made a second motion. Yes. So, but, no. I can I just <laughs> because Why? this is I'm not me. So it, I'm not calling this a substitute motion. I'm no. Sure. Member Matthews has included, it. and so this would be like a another motion, I guess, right. in addition that we vote after uh, whether it makes perfect sense as an amendment to the main motion. And so you can vote on the amendment first, and then vote on the main motion. Okay, okay. okay. that works. So let's go ahead and vote on the amendment to the main motion. To accept it. To accept it, yeah, which was made by Councilmember Brown, seconded by mm -hmm. Councilmember Byers. Councilmember Byers? You're muted. Catherine, you're muted. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? No. Brown? Aye. Colder? Uh, no. Watkins? No. Vice Mayor Myers? No. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that motion fails with council members Byers. Brown and Cummings voting in favor, and Watkins, Matthews, Golder, and Vice Mayor Myers voting opposed. And so we'll go back to the main motion at this point, which was made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Mayor Cummings. Going for the vote now, Mayor? Yes, please. Okay. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, well, thank, I want to thank all the presenters, members of the public who were able to come out and join us this evening, city staff, and um, and all of our presenters uh, for a really good study session that provided a That's lot great. of information on, on um, mental health crisis response. And so with that, uh, we'll see everyone next Tuesday at our regularly scheduled city council meeting. Take care. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, not next Tuesday, the 24th. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. November 24th. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Goodbye.